We would play Sarah now, Gary said. You know, she was a child of the 80s. But play her um, and what had happened to her. And that intrigued me. And that sort of buzzed around for, for, for a little while. And I thought, well, yes, I, I, I am me. And as I've gone on in life, you know, you think, I played a character, and that character's nothing like me. It's, you know, I step into the role. And I've come to, you know, really take a back seat and think... I'd used more of myself than I thought, so I thought, well, I can use myself now, and I'm still Sarah. G'day audiophiles, this is the Science of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. G'day Philip. It's a really special episode we've got for our final full episode for 2022. And I'm very happy to be uh, sharing this as our last episode of the year. We're featuring Sarah Jane Smith Series 1 because it's the 20th anniversary, and this was your suggestion, Philip, so it must have a very special place in your heart. It does have a special place in my heart. I mean, I loved them when they first came out. Elizabeth Sladen has a special place in my heart as well, which is part of the reason this has a special place. And mind you, this has got bigger than I did expect it when I suggested it early in the year, but it's a, yeah, it's a pretty exciting tribute to a, a great first season of Sarah Jane Smith. Yes, because uh, very soon we're going to be doing a retrospective on Series 2 as well. But it's Series 1 that's got the 20th anniversary. Stick around because we're going to be chatting with a few different people involved with the production, including director-producer Gary Russell. We're going to be talking with Jez Fielder. And we're going to be showing some archive uh, footage from Sadie Miller, her chat with us. Unfortunately, Sadie wanted to join us for this, but she couldn't for this time. So we'll see what we can do for Series 2. We're also going to be speaking with David Bishop, who wrote one of the stories, and Peter Angelides. So uh, some really fascinating insights that we've got coming up on this fantastic series that you can get as a complete sort of box set download now from bigfinish.com. You can, and at the moment, if you're listening to this within the first week of it coming out, it's on special and very cheap. So it's really worth going and buying it if you haven't already done it. Yes, so we can highly recommend that. So what do you remember about the series, Philip, as a, as a whole when it first came out? How were you feeling about the first series of Sarah Jane Smith? Well, this was still very early on in the whole big finish range, and so it hadn't been going for that long. I guess it's been going a couple of years. Uh, but um, this was one of the big branch aways, which, and probably the one I was most excited about. So, you know, Sarah Jane Smith has always been huge in my, my life. And of course, at the time when, when Big Finish started, there was the policy of if, you know, if there was no doctor for the companion, the companion just didn't appear because they weren't going to feature companions without the doctors. And because Tom Baker at that stage wouldn't work with Big Finish, it seemed like there was no hope of ever getting Sarah Jane onto the show. And so when this was announced, I was really excited because Sarah Jane's always been my favorite companion. So to actually get a, a box set of, you know, well, it, wasn't, it would have been a box set today, but a series of five plays was just so exciting. What was your first feelings? My first memories, I don't have any strong memories of when it was actually released, but there was a time when the whole series one and series two had been released that my daughter and I, she was, oh, she must have been eight or nine at the time. And Sarah Jane Smith, uh, uh, the Sarah Jane Smith Adventures on television had just aired and she was a huge fan of that so on this road trip we listened to all of these i quickly discovered that the sarah jane smith big finish stories were a little bit more adult than the tv episodes so we cracked on and we we listened to them and she enjoyed them and she was she was a huge fan of sarah jane as well because of the television series so that's my overriding memory of that that road trip where i listened to all of them on that one road trip so um, very very fond memories for me but i understand philip that you have an even more special memory of elizabeth sladen that uh, comes from just before this re was released my uh, big memory of elizabeth sladen um you know aside from when she appeared in australia but i had nothing much to do with her than just you know saw her on stage 
was I went to a convention on Newcastle on Tyne um, in, in England. So I'd been traveling overseas and this convention I wanted to get to and I met a whole heap of Doctor Who people there. But when I when I met um, Elizabeth on the first day on the Saturday and you know, went up and you know, had my photo taken with her and got her to do some autographing, she sort of commented on the fact I was Australian. So yes, I've come over to Australia and a large part was just to meet you. I didn't say that to her, but a large part of why I was there was because, you know, got to meet Elizabeth Slayton. And she said, oh, well, you know, why don't we, you know, do you want to meet in the bar later tonight and you can buy me a drink? <laughs> so, oh, yeah, okay. And so we arranged to meet at eight o'clock in the bar when yeah, all the all that stuff was over and yeah, I'd arrived and we both had got at the same time and there was a table free, so we took the table and I sort of said, Oh, what do you want to drink? And she said, Well, how long do you want to chat with me for? I said, Oh, yeah, I'm, as long as you've got. And she said, Well, you better buy a bottle then. <laughs> um so went over and got a got a bottle of wine and we came and sat down and yeah, we, we had a bottle and people would keep coming over and chatting with us and joining us and leaving again. But I just had a whole evening with Elizabeth Slade and, and it's one of those most special moments of my life. So you didn't have to give it a second thought then, get that bottle of wine? Uh, no, or the second bottle of wine that I got as well. I didn't give a second <laughs> thought to either. It was very well worth the price of you know, every cent that those two bottles cost me. Uh, it was worth every cent. Would, would you say that that is your most memorable Doctor Who fan experience? I've had a few, but that one is certainly up there. Excellent. Before we get into our interviews, we might bring up Gary Russell first. But before we do that, we'll we'll start off with giving a, a brief rundown on the first episode that was released in the Sarah Jane Smith series, which was called Comeback. It was written by Terence Dix. And shall I read the blurb? That's a great idea. Six months after the last part of her undercover investigative TV series for Planet 3 Broadcasting went out, Sarah Jane Smith is running scared. Living under false names, her true identity compromised, she has few friends and fewer clues as to her pursuers. Enter three people who will change her life, the mysterious Mr. Harris, old friend Ellie Martin, and a guardian angel in the shape of the roguish Josh Townsend. Now, all roads lead to the village of Clutes Coombe in Wiltshire. But will she find the answers she needs there? Well, Lavinia, I hope you liked your day in the limelight. I think you'd have hated it, actually. All those people going on about how wonderful, how successful, how much a pillar of society you were. Sarah Jane Smith. First I lose the house in Denham, then the flat in Chalk Farm, and now this one. One day, I just may get to unpack. I know you're a famous investigative reporter. Yeah, well, I used to be. Um, let's just say the investigating reporter racket's been falling off a bit recently. St. Clotilde's Well. There, I must correct you. The correct title is Old Clute's Well. Old Clute, as I'm sure you know, is another name for the devil. It was always a place of power. The Christian church took it over, as it did so many pagan places and festivals. But the power was still there, biding its time. This is Harris. I have a job for Mr. Chakravati. Come on, you. I think it might be safer to take public transport. But what about your car? Welcome to my world, Mr. Townsend. I think I shall be asking some important questions of your representative tomorrow. You really shouldn't do that, Vicar. Are you threatening me? Yes, I rather think I am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Harris. How is Miss Smith? In mourning. Nothing compared to how she'll be tomorrow morning. Okay, Philip, have you got some quick facts on the story for me? Yep, this is Comeback, the facts and the trivia. So, written, as you said, by Terence Dix, recorded the 7th of March 2002 at the Moat Studios and released July 2002, starring Elizabeth Sladen, Jeremy James and Sadie Miller. Though Jeremy James is also known as Jez Fielder, who we'll be meeting later. Directed by Gary Russell and music and sound designed by David Darlington. Although this was the first story released, it was actually the last story to be recorded. Sadie Miller is the daughter of Elizabeth Sladen and Brian Miller. Sadie was in drama school at the time that this was recorded. David Jackson is best known for his portrayal as Gan in Blake 7, and this was to be his only big finish outing. Robin Bowman as the baddie Harris 
was added after he had been so, so successful in the third story, Test of Nerve. Robin Bowman is the brother of Lisa Bowman, Big Finishes of Bernie Summerfield, also director. The opening scene was written by Gary Russell and name checked several people who were in K Nun Company Lavinia Smith, Brendan Richards, and Juno Baker. The actress playing Ellie Martin, Juliet Warner, re recorded several scenes on this day from the previous production she'd done because originally she was the book companion character Sam Jones but now it was changed back to a different character because they thought Sam Jones made the whole thing too cluttered. Thank you for that, Philip. I think the the, the one thing that stands out for me is, I, I really like the way this is written, actually. It's Terence Dix's only contribution to Big Finish, apart from, I think he did something called Rebecca's World. Uh, he also did, he redid the plays play, The Seven Keys Doomsday. Oh, right. And he did a companion chronicle based on that. Okay. So he actually did So he did a couple of things. So I'm glad, you I'm glad you checked me on that. So that's good. He didn't do an awful lot. So uh, I enjoyed it for that. But what I enjoyed this mostly for, apart from Sarah Jane Smith, obviously, was David Jackson. He plays the villain so well. And as a Blake 7 fan, I'd not seen David Jackson in any other role other than Gan. So to see him playing that nice guy throughout there, it was such a contrast to playing the villain, and he was so good at it. Do you agree? Oh, it, it was wonderful. I mean, he's got a voice that just melts. Uh, just beautiful voice. But, yes, he was just despicable. And it was, yeah, <laughs> wonderful to see. And, you know, huge Blake Seven fan. I think by this stage, Jacqueline Pierce had already appeared in some big Finnish audios. I think off the top of my head, this is probably only the second. Blake said, oh, no, Sally Nevette would have been in, already in spare parts by now too. But, you know, slowly, bit by bit, um, Blake Seven people were coming across. But unfortunately, yeah. I mean, I think I think um, David Jackson would have been in more, except for his very untimely and early death. Yeah, that was such a shame. But anyway, this is an excellent story, which uh, you would have got a taste of in the trailer. But we want to talk to some of the people involved in it. Uh, and we're going to start off with Gary Russell. Now, when we when we had Gary Russell on, the first thing we asked was, obviously, how did Sarah Jane Smith, the series come about it was 100 percent my idea and i said to jason i wanted to do a spin-off was it our first spin-off because we hadn't done gallifrey at that point nick had done dalek empire and possibly dalek war hadn't done cybermen i don't think and so i suggested jason i wanted to do a spin-off as well and i wanted to do sarah jane uh because i just thought well oh, of course we that's right oh, yes that's where it goes back to We'd worked with Liz right at the very beginning on the Bennies. Uh, she had come in and done Walk Into Babylon. And I think in conversations with her, she was like, well, what are you, because we, did we have the Doctor Who license? I think we had just had our first meeting with the BBC about possibly getting the Doctor Who license. It was around that time. And so it obviously was something we were talking about um, and she must have said, you know, oh, well, I don't think I'd ever want to play Sarah Jane again. I like playing the parts I'm playing in Babylon, but oh, I wouldn't want to play Sarah Jane again. Kind of red rag to a bull for me. Uh, so that, yeah, three or four years later, I'm saying to Jason, I want to do Sarah Jane. Um, and I think Jason was like, but Liz said she, and I said, oh, no, you leave Liz to me. Um, so I, I phoned her up one day out of the blue and said, right, madam. You said you didn't want to play Sarah Jane. However, rather than team you up with the Doctor and have you playing, you know, second fiddle, as you have done many times in the past, and I promise there won't be a tin dog, how do you fancy the idea of a four-part Sarah Jane series? Out on her own in the world, being an investigative journalist, but doing sort of spooky x files -y kind of things. And she said no, straight away. And I went, go on. No, go on. Then that, I think after about 10 minutes of go on, no, go on, no, it turned into, right, we'll have a coffee. So we went, we met up at Bond Street Station a few days later and we went out for a coffee. And she said, right, when we do this, this is what you're going to do, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's all fine. She was, Liz was always incredibly protective of Sarah Jane. She, she just lived and breathed the character. She knew the character backwards. So she knew what Sarah Jane would and wouldn't do in given situations. 
And I was like, well, yeah, you know, there's no point in asking you to come and do this series and then giving you stuff you don't want to do. So obviously everything you're talking about will factor in. I think there are a couple of things I pushed back on and said, I don't think actually that's the direction I want to take, Sarah. I want to take it more in the spooky, supernaturally kind of thing, but with a scientific basis. And so we compromised in the middle on there. Um, and she had no major um, demands or anything. There was no sort of, my dressing room must have red Smarties in it or anything like that. She did say, would there be a chance of having a walk-on part, <coughs> as you do on audio, um, for Sadie? And I've known, I knew, I've known Sadie since she was a bump in Lizzie's tummy. Um, so that was, you know, I was like, yeah, of course. I knew Sadie was doing acting at that point. Um, and actually I created a main character for her, which I think threw Liz a little bit. And I'm not sure that with hindsight, that might not have been the best idea because then immediately I think Liz thought, oh, you're doing this because you might replace me for a second season with my daughter. And it was like, no, you said you wanted a nice part for, for Sadie. And I thought the best thing I can do is make her your companion. Um, and then we added in uh, Jesse's character as well. And it was quite, it was quite fun because when they met, I, I know that Liz and Jez met before we recorded. I can't think whether they met at a big finish party or so certainly I don't think they'd work together. They got like house on fire. So she was immediately relaxed. She had Sadie with her. She had Jez with her. She had me. She was happy to do this. Um, she wanted, she didn't want script approval at all. She wanted writer approval. So her idea was deaf. I, uh, the first writer I had was David Bishop. He wrote the first script, actually. That's the one I sent her. We commissioned it. Um, Jason agreed to commission Dave Bishop's script before we had a series so that Liz could see what we were doing. So that was the first one we re wrote and the first one we actually recorded. Um, and she said, I think you should get Barry Letts to do one. And I said, that appeals to me enormously. Um, I said, how about Terence? I wanted to bring Terence into Big Finish for a long time. Boom, she was really up for that. So that was my next port of call, was to phone both Barry and Terence that evening and say, we're doing a series with Liz. Boom, boom, boom. Yep, they were on board. Uh, Terence, I asked to write the first one. Barry, I asked to write the second one. And then, I, had, I got Rupert and Peter Angelides involved. Um, I think Peter is the only person I didn't give a storyline to in any way, shape or form. I mean, I was very loose with what I gave Dave Bishop. Rupert I gave a sort of scenario to and he moved it to Eastern Europe, which I thought was interesting. Peter came up completely with his own. Um, Terence I gave a storyline to. I said, you know, I want spooky village where everything's a bit because that feels a good entry point for the show and i gave a storyline to barry which he didn't like so he came back with with the one about uh, all the dow stuff um so i had my my five brilliant scripts did barry originally do a story about voodoo and it had to be changed to Taoism? is that right i don't think it was about voodoo it was it might have been the uh, no, it wasn't about voodoo per se. Uh, sorry, yes, you've just I've forgotten that. Mm, it was <laughs> it was about black about black culture in southeast London, um, and I think it was Dominic that probably said to Barry, "Dad, that is the most racist thing you've ever written. You cannot possibly submit that script." It wasn't really that it was about voodoo. I think there might have been a little bit of the sort of that cultural appropriation in it. Um, I never saw any of this. It, it, that never even got to me. I didn't even see a storyline about it. Um, I just remember Barry saying, you know, I was thinking of doing this, but Dominic says that's probably not a good idea because it might be seen as a bit racist. And I think I remember saying to him, yeah, I would be decidedly uncomfortable with that. Um, and he said, well, the only thing I would be quite happy to do something about is Taoism. And I thought, well, there's no one in the world that knows more about it than you. Um, so he went and did that. And what I loved is, um, he gave us, Big Finish his first gay villain um, and made him a real bastard as well and I really liked that fact I, you know, it's like, yeah, everyone, every time somebody writes gay people into 
anything connected with Doctor Who. They're always nice people. And actually, some of us can be complete shit. And it was good to have a villain who was a complete and utter shit. And I really, really like that. All right, Philip. So we'll jump in here and talk about story number two, which has by now already been mentioned by by Gary, uh, written by Barry Letts. So it was pretty cool to have Barry Letts and Terence Dix involved in this series. And of course... If anyone's going to write about some kind of uh, religious connection, it's going to be Barry Letts, and his story is called The Tao Connection. I'll read the blurb for it. The body of an old man is found floating in the Thames, although the DNA of the corpse corresponds to an 18-year-old friend of Josh and Ellie. Sarah Jane heads towards West Yorkshire in a bid to discover what killed the man, why someone is kidnapping homeless teenage boys, and whether there is a link between that and the retreat of philanthropist Will Butley, which hosts the Huang Ti Clinic, Sarah discovers that there is more to ancient dark sorcery than she previously believed. Big issue! My name's Toby Davenport, age 17. Uh, 18 now, I suppose. Go back and get it right, you moron. Straight up, Gov, it's a perfect match. Davenport. Him. Why? Apparently he's taken off somewhere. No one's seen him for yonks. They thought he might have gone back up north. But at the weekend, he rang Mike at the shelter a, a bit spooked. So Mike thought if he loses his spot to one of the gangs, he'll have to start all over again. Seriously, Nat, this has really bugged me. It's bad enough having to sleep in doorways. He's just a kid. Could be one of mine if I had any. But just to be wiped off the face of the... I mean, it's as bad as Argentina and that just... Okay, okay, I get your drift. And the word Tao itself means the way. A way of life. Certainly. But far more than that, one might call it the way of nature. It is the stillness beneath the turmoil of creation. The emptiness which is the mother of the 10,000 things. The eternity in the present moment. Once you mentioned Toby's name, they just clammed up. You don't understand. At my age, if I go without more than one, I'll... I'll... Peg out. Kick the bucket, shuffle off this mortal coil, or is die the word you're looking for? Yes, of course. Sarah Jane Smith, the bitch. The Dow Connection, the facts and the trivia, written by Barry Letts. Recorded the 27th of February 2002 at the Moat Studios and released in August 2002. Starring Elizabeth Sladen, Jeremy James and Sadie Miller. Directed by Gary Russell and music and sound design David Darlington. Barry Letts was the producer of Doctor Who between 1969 and 1974 and cast Elizabeth Sladen as the role of Sarah Jane Smith. He originally had a storyline about voodoo, but when his son read through it, his son thought it might cause offence and so it was changed to Taoism. Is the only, this is the only story that Barry Letts would write for Big Finish. Sarah uses Venusian Aikido that she learned from an old friend. And Department C-19 is mentioned here, which was previously mentioned in both Time Flight and Project Twilight. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, I thought this was, a, this was a very strange story, but it's always one that really sticks in my head. And I think this is really weird. And then by the end of it, it is it sort of comes together really well. I kind of find myself thinking all the way through what is going on here, and then it sort of comes together. Real. I don't know whether you felt the same, Philip. Yeah, it's it is a very un, it's, a, it's a bit more unusual. It's a bit more tortured, actually. This is probably yeah, more, true. It, it, it's, it, it's quite gruesome in parts. It is, and it, it feels quite tortured. Um, in fact, I think all these stories, in some ways, feel a bit tortured in in terms of the monster down the well. This first season, in particular, the the, the, um, the thing I love is um, Elizabeth Sladen's northern performance. Um, I think originally they were playing, her, they wanted her to do a different sort of accent, but I think Elizabeth Sladen talked about the fact that, well, she comes from Liverpool, and so doing a northern accent was much more natural for her to move into. And so the whole scenes where she's playing the uh, the maid and using the northern accent, I think, is, is quite delightful. And once again, you just see this developing relationship between her and Josh and the way they play off each other. So it, it's nice having the, the Sarah Jane as the main character with the companion, being being Josh, and then you've got the brains behind the whole scene um, with, with Sadie. But some some lovely scenes throughout this, and it's a bit disturbing, but interesting. That's the word. Disturbing is the word for sure. But uh, it's it's one that certainly stands out in my mind in the series. That's for sure. 
So by now we have heard of Jeremy James, a.k.a. Jez Fielder, and we had the opportunity to have a great discussion with him, didn't we, Philip? He, it was an amazing night. He was a lot of fun and just kept talking and talking, and I learned so much about so many things. And when you hear others make comments about Jez, you certainly get what they're saying when you're actually talking with him. But of course, with the name, Jeremy James, which he has a lot of credits for in Big Finish, uh, and Jez Fielder, which he also has a lot of credits for in Big Finish, our first question, obviously, was about the name. Now, if we look at the credits on Sarah Jane Smith, we won't find a <laughs> Jez Fielder there. Here we'll, we go. We'll find yeah. Jeremy James. So who are you? Well, um, <laughs> I'm obviously a torn man, you have before. <laughs> um, Jeremy James, well, well, um, there's a name I haven't heard for a very long time. No, it's, um, it's actually my, my name is my name is Jeremy James Fielder. Um, and foolishly or otherwise, when I, when I started um, acting, I <laughs> threw, on the advice of no one other than myself, I said, oh, I should have a stage name. And I don't know what decade I thought I was in, um, but it wasn't the one I was in. And I thought, oh no, I'll, I'll be, I'll call myself. Wasn't there a great? Isn't with Nail and I? Doesn't doesn't Richard E. Grant say, "What do you think? I think I'm calling myself Donald Twain." And it was a bit like that. And then I was chatting away with some some friends, and they were like, "Well, you could just call yourself, you know, Jeremy." And I I actually really hate the name Jeremy. I've always hated it, and so I became Jez at a very very young age. And then my my parents don't call me Jeremy, but. Jeremy James sounded to me to have the sort of requisite gravitas <laughs> or, or ludicrousness that was was uh, called for in this circumstance. And I just went with it. And then the first, I think, um, yeah, so I think I think I was I was down as Jez Fielder for the first the first ever big finish I did. And then it was after that. You, you swing back, but you swing backwards and forwards. You've got 44 as Jeremy James and 18 as Jez Fielder. So you, you were actually swinging backwards and forwards constantly throughout your whole time. No, I know I didn't. I don't. I didn't. There was a. It was a. It was Jez Fielder when I did the. So the second ever big finish was called Phantasmagoria. Yes. Nineteen ninety. Well, you, you don't need me to tell you this. This is why you're. This you're the expert. And it was written by um, Mark Gatiss, and it's the first. It was the first acting job I I, I ever had in my life. Um, and I'd I'd met Nick Briggs at, uh, in a pub. You'll be unsurprised to hear, in in Hastings, um, which is a a town on the on the south south coast of England, where there was a very famous battle a thousand years ago. Um, and uh, I was playing in a band, um, singing and playing the electric guitar. And after the gig, Nick Briggs, who I'd never met before in my life just introduced himself and said, oh, hi, hello, my name's Nick and I'm a producer. Um, I'd like you to do some work for me. Would you be interested? And of course, I've just come off stage singing and playing the guitar, haven't I? So when someone says I'm a producer, you expect them to be a music producer. <laughs> so that's what I thought he was. And I said, oh, right. Yeah, um, of course, I'd, let's, I mean, let's, we can have a chat. What do you, what, what is it you need? Do you need, um, you need session? Do you need vocals, guitar? What? And he went, oh no, of course you think that. No, 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 no. Um, sorry, let's start again. Um, I'm um, Nicholas Briggs, and I'm an audio uh, drama producer. And I really liked your your voice in between songs. So that's basically he'd enjoyed the banter with the audience between. It wasn't anything to do with my music. <laughs> no, I said I've been vaguely insulted, but no, it was it was really nice. We had a, we had a beer and had a chat, and he said, "Look, it's it's Doctor Who," and I went, "Oh, well, if it's okay, then sold. Whatever it is, I don't care." And he goes, "Oh, oh are you a fan of the show?" I said, "Well, I'm not." The guy that I was playing in a band with, his name's John Ewan, and he's a brilliant, brilliant, one of the best drummers of his generation. And he's a proper, proper Hoovian. Like he's got that, he's got the bookshelf, he's got the kind of TARDIS bookshelf and opens up and, you know, all the videos are in there. And it's, he's got all, he knows everything about it and he quotes it. And um, I just, I just kind of liked it and watched it with, um, with Tom Baker and Peter Davison when I was a kid. So, but I was a, but I was a really big fan of Tom Baker. Um, and kind of followed him, his career and everything he did after, after Doctor Who as well, because I just thought it was mesmerising. So after a couple of years of just doing all sorts of bits and pieces with Big Finish, they asked you, well, how did you hear about the Sarah Jane Smith stories? Yeah, so 
I knew you were going to ask me that, and I and I had to really rack my brains to remember this because this is about this is over twenty years ago, now, just about. And but I do remember. Well, it's, it was the twentieth anniversary. We were really seeing this to celebrate the twentieth anniversary. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yes, we 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 recorded it in February two thousand two, I think. So yeah, it is a twenty. Oh, I see. Happy anniversary, everyone. Um, yeah, Gary Russell um, took me out onto the balcony of a party and i can't remember whose party it was but it was quite late and he said oh i've got something i need really need to talk to you about it's really important um and i said well i'm i'm here let's let's he said, no no we need to i need to talk to you properly we went out to this balcony and it was quiet out there and he said how do you feel about being um a companion and i said what to a you mean to a doctor no 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 to a to a doctor's companion in a special we're going to do i said stop being cryptic what is what are you talking about he said well i don't know how much you know about doctor who because this is still quite early on you know we i'd probably done about uh, three or four audios um at, at this point and i was just getting involved in the judge dread stuff and the dalek empire stuff was coming later that uh, the following year so I, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't had countless um, conversations with with the lads about, you know, how much I was into Doctor Who, and certainly wasn't into it in, in anywhere near as much as they were. But I had a bit of a grasp of it. And he said, "Do you know who Sarah Jane Smith is?" I said, "Yes, I do." So, well, we're gonna we're gonna write. This is this is all very hush hush. And I don't know why it was, but um, we're gonna write a series um, with Sarah Jane Smith as the as the main character, and we'd like you to be her her companion, her psychic. I don't know, is that something you'd be interested in? I went, yes, I'll do that. Brilliant. He says, have you ever met Liz? No, never met Liz. Okay, well, we'll make sure you two meet at some point. But um, basically, um, I need to ask you some just a few things about, about your life. I was like, why do you want to know about my life? What's that got to do with it? And he said, well, because we're kind of basing him on you. I was like, oh, mm, really? Is he an international rock star? Said, no, no, he isn't, and nor are you. So shut up. <laughs> So um, I think, so jo Josh went to university in Glasgow and so did I. And there's kind of, there's a few parallels and the, the, the timeline's quite similar. I, I, I should put on record. The criminal guys, background? I, I was going to say, I haven't, got, I haven't been to a young offenders institution. <laughs> but, you are, but you are a hero. <laughs> well, it's a matter, matter, matter of opinion. Um, but um, <laughs> certainly it was, it was very flattering actually that, but I just got on with everyone. Like I, with everyone I worked with, and you know, on the, on those early big finish ones, we just had a really nice time, and I wasn't I wasn't difficult to work with, and you know, I wasn't a, a not not that lots of people are, but you know, it was just easy. And they were like, "Bring him in; he'll be all right." And they and they'll get and they thought I'd get on with Liz, and I didn't know Liz, and I didn't know anything about her other than who she was, and I'd seen I'd seen her, I'd seen her. Actually, I should tell you this story. Um, <laughs> um so the the, the a, a few weeks a couple of months pass and there's a there's a big finish party they used to have them quite regularly but um i don't know what happened but um now they're kind of every 10 years but there was a christmas party and i don't know i can't remember where it was it's all blurs into one but um gary was there and he said oh great you're here liz is here i said oh so that's still happening then he said, yeah, 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 yeah. Still, oh, it's still going on. You're still interested, right? I said, yeah. Said, well, you have got to meet and, and look, I'm going to find her. Come with me. We'll find Liz. So we found found Liz. Um, I don't I can't remember where Liz was, but she was there somewhere. And um, Liz Sladen, this is Jess Fielder. It's going to be your companion. Oh, hello. I've heard so much about you. I said, hello, Liz. Said, and this strike, this, 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 she just looked the same as she did in Doctor Who. It was really odd. It's like, this striking, this striking woman, um, be beautiful, beautiful woman. And just like, wow, she's, she just kind of has this oh, aura. And I just thought that, well, other than obviously thinking she was gorgeous, I was just really pleased to meet her. And then we just started chatting away and Gary was sort of, oh, he had a look on his face like, um, oh God, I thought he was going to say something awful and he hasn't. I'm really pleased. That kind of relieved face. Um, but I didn't let him down after that because uh, I said, um, 
uh, she asked me what I'd have, whether I'd seen Doctor Who and you know know anything about the character. And I said, yeah, I've seen I've seen a lot of the stuff with. Uh, well, I didn't. I haven't seen much of, much of the stuff with John. I saw a lot of the stuff with Tom Baker. She said, okay, so you kind of you're you're conversant with what, what the character. I said, oh yeah, absolutely. I said, and um, and I saw because I had, um, I saw Canine and Company. I saw that pilot um, episode. Oh, you shouldn't have said that. Well, it gets worse. Uh, it was entirely my fault as well. Um, and actually, this is a great barometer for for Liz. So, so I said, yeah, I saw Canine and Company, and I could <laughs> get, get her to audibly hear Gary go, Ooh. and she goes, oh yes. Um, what did you think of that then? And I said, I said, oh no, I thought it was. I thought it came across really well. She said, really? I went, no. <laughs> And Gary went, oh god! And Liz and Liz started laughing. And then Gary's like, oh, she's laughing. Oh, she thinks it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> and then he starts laughing as well, out of, out of sheer relief. And um, and at that moment, I was like, me and her are going to get on just fine. And um, and we we did. So that's that's what happened at the beginning of of um, the Sarah Jane Adventures. That's how we we got together, and then they introduced us, and it we, we sussed each other out, and it was there was no question it was going to be it was going to be fine because she's got a uh, She's got a wicked sense of humor, and I think she enjoyed it. <laughs> she probably went home and told her family that I was an ass. <laughs> she covered it up well, if that's the case. <laughs> it's weird, but I I think he looks quite like Pertwee. <laughs> Pertwee was younger. I don't know how he would take that. And I, actually, I told him, and I think he's incorporating it into the character now. I, I mustn't say it too much. Um, well, I suppose, really, I am now taking on a role that he is now... <laughs> He hasn't exactly got the Sarah lines because he wouldn't stand for it. But it's great. I mean, I mean, we have a lovely relationship. It, it's 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 so nice if it happens immediately, you know. And it took very little time. I mean, he's very funny. He makes me laugh, mm -hmm. and he's quite loud. Yes. And I like that. <laughs> Why do we employ him? He's disrespectful, <laughs> isn't he? It's not disrespect. It's erotic compulsion. <laughs> Would you agree with that, Liz? I just hear just, it just say yes. Just say yes. Uh, yeah, she does. She, she's mad about me. So the third story in the Sarah Jane Smith series is called Test of Nerve. It, and I'm sure this will come out in the facts, but it was actually uh, the first one recorded, uh, written by David Bishop. And I will read the blurb for you. Sarah Jane Smith receives a mysterious gift with a cryptic message. The London Underground will suffer an horrific terrorist attack during rush hour unless Sarah can stop those responsible. As rush hour draws closer, the terrifying reality of the threat becomes all too apparent. One friend is murdered and another abducted. Sarah must be willing to sacrifice everyone and everything she holds dear to save the city. This is one deadline she cannot miss. The time is eight o'clock. Here are this morning's headlines. A group of New Age travellers claim they were illegally evicted from a disused London underground station last night. Sarah Jane Smith. Test of nerve. Dear Miss Smith, you have 24 hours to find the truth. Otherwise, all of London will suffer the same fate as your friend. There's no signature, no address. Remember that news item about the scuffle outside the private lab? Yeah. There's more to buy a guard than meets the eye. Police are releasing the man involved in a scuffle with a junior minister. James Michael Carver, a former soldier and veterans' rights campaigner, will face no charges over the incident. I could be jailed for what I'm about to tell you, Sarah. You're right, something is up. London's intelligence community is on high alert. Someone is threatening to kill thousands, even millions, to get at you. Sarah James Smith. D.R. Morrison. You'll have to accompany me to the station, Miss Smith, to answer some questions. Of course, I can give you a full statement. You misunderstand. We got a phone call saying you killed this young woman. We're taking you in on suspicion of murder. Why are you doing this? Revenge for my employers. And who are they? <laughs> now, that would be telling. Me, I just like doing the dirty work. Miss Smith, I'm James Carver. You must help me. Test of Nerve, the facts and the trivia. Written by David Bishop, but recorded the 23rd of February, 2002, at the Moat Studios, released September 2002, starring Elizabeth Sladen, Jeremy James and Sadie Miller. And, once again, directed by Gary Russell and music and sound designed by David Darlington. 
This was the last script to be commissioned and yet the first one to be recorded. In fact, it was commissioned, written and recorded in exactly a month. In exactly a month. The character of Sam Jones was originally written and recorded, but needed to be changed when it was considered it was just too much baggage being brought forward from the Doctor Who book range. Roy Skelton, who plays a major role in this production, was one of the original voices of the Daleks. And Gary liked the character of Harris so much, he had him written into the first story and the last story. Excellent. So when I was listening to this recently, Philip, I certainly got a sense of the time that this came out because this is dealing with uh, a terrorist attack, which obviously in London, they weren't, well, they, they weren't common, but they weren't unknown. Uh, but the whole world in 2002 was still reeling from the events of 9-11. So it really struck me as interesting. And I mean, we, we did speak to uh, David Bishop about that and what his thought process was behind writing such a story. It, would it be sort of the the heaviest, hardest hitting story? I mean, the Dow connection was pretty heavy too, but this is heavy in a, in a different way because it's sort of more world encompassing. This is certainly the action packed version of Sarah Jane Smith. So the first story was the mystery in the English village, which they do so well. And even the second one was still a secluded house, English house. So they, they, they did the secluded village, they did the secluded house, but this is the all out action adventure, which I'm not sure Doctor Who ever really did. So in some ways, this is the, probably the, the biggest departure from what Sarah Jane would have done. Um, it has got a huge cliffhanger as well. But this is really the format that I think really works so well. This is the one that everyone listened to and thought, oh, this is the way we want to go. And later on, when we discuss series two, we'll see that this is actually the model they use for series two. So this, this first series, each of the five different adventures are experimenting and trying very different things. Um, I think all of them work really well. And part of why I love this series so much is because every story changes its feel. But this, I think, is actually the one that became the most popular, the one that was most successful. So David Bishop is the writer of the third story. And we started off by asking him how he came to write for Sarah Jane Smith. Yeah, I've been, I've been looking back at my archives, trying to piece it back together. And the earliest note I can find is from November 2001. And even then, I think rumours have been circulating that Big Finish were planning to do some Sarah Jane Smith standalone audios. Liz Sladen was signed up for it. And they were potentially looking for writers. And I know Gary Russell was going to be in charge of uh, what proved to be the first of two seasons. So I reached out to Gary, who I knew socially and and uh, and through sort of mutual acquaintance, um, and said, well, you know, if you are going to do Sarah Jane Smith, I would love to write for Sarah Jane, my favourite companion of all time. Um, so if there's any chance whatsoever, please consider me. And... Uh, tumbleweed pass by for a while because I'm sure every every writer of of who related items at that point had probably been queuing up to talk to Gary about this and then he got back in touch mid-November 2001 and uh, he had been talking with Liz they had some ideas about what they wanted to do what they didn't want it to do uh, they didn't want it to be like sort of canine company which I know is you know a camp classic but uh, is not what Liz wanted to do with the stories at all, was the impression I was getting from Carrie. And Liz had actually recorded, I guess, a forerunner of a podcast, effectively, where she talked about what would have happened to Sarah Jane after, you know, she left the doctor, what her life would be like, how she would be working as a journalist and those sorts of things, and uh, sort of where the character might have gone. So anybody who was interested in writing for the Sarah Jane audios was given, sent this tape that Liz had recorded talking about uh, the character and how it could have evolved and a few notes from Gary about what they wanted to do and invited to pitch, write a, a story pitch for what you wanted to do. And it needed to be signed off by Gary and it needed to be signed off by Liz. So I don't know how many people pitched for, for the gig. It was going to be five episodes, an hour long each. So it was different from the big finish releases of the time and they were all 25 minutes replicating the TV format, generally four episodes. So I pitched the story that became Test of Nerve. I wrote that quite quickly, my pitch for that, sent it to Gary and then waited. And then Gary got back in touch uh, after Christmas, I think it was towards the start of January 2002 and said, 
uh, Liz has read these, I've read these, and and the two of us, there are three we particularly like. We want to take those three, definitely these three forward, and we're having other conversations with other people. But mine was one of the stories that uh, both Liz and Gary wanted to develop further. So the story that became Test of Nerve, I think my working title was Going Underground, which is not a great working title for the story, although it ties into what happens in it. Test of Nerve is far better. I'm terrible at titles. Almost all of my stories have their titles changed. And it actually stemmed from, I think there were some very loose ideas, potential ideas for stories that have been supplied by Gary that you could develop something from this, some sort of springboards for people to pitch ideas for. And one was about, I think it was about sort of a threat to the London underground or to shoot to transport systems. And years before, Virgin Books, who, who published the, the New Adventures and the, the Doctor Who novelizations before that as Target Books, had been talking about launching their own series of uh, sort of espionage, high-octane thrillers, and they were looking for writers to write for that. So I came up with a pitch for them and did a lot of research into terrorist incidents and how it would operate in London if there was a terrorist incident. And this is all be long before 9-11 and everything else where terrorism became much more of an international thing. Obviously, in the UK, you've had terrorists have been blowing up parts of the UK for many years for one thing or another, the troubles in Ireland and things like that in Northern Ireland. So I'd done a lot of research into this. And then the virgin idea for these uh, sort of techno thrillers never came about. So that material all just sat in a corner waiting for me to ever come back to it. And then this Sarah Jane opportunity came up and I thought, well, that perfectly chimes with these ideas and this research I've done previously. So I fused the two together, wrote my story pitch and sent it in to Gary. And as I say, he came back to me in January and said, OK, this could be a go. Oh, however... Uh, Liz's availability means that we're going to be recording this in four weeks time. Can you write at least two drafts of your script in the next two to three weeks? And I was like, yes, absolutely. Um, now, at this point, I had just started writing for Big Finish. I was writing, they did some uh, audio dramas based on Judge Dredd and other 2008 characters from the comic book. And I'd worked on the comic in the past. So I was writing Judge Dredd audio dramas for Big Finish, which in fact, John Ainsworth was uh, one of the producers working on that particular line at the time. But I think I only had one or possibly two under my belt and I was still had a lot to learn about how to write good audio drama. So uh, Gary wrote to me and said in mid-January, said, would you like to write your story? I'm going to rename it this, Test of Nerve. And I went, that's a much better title. Well done, Gary. And there are certain elements of the story of the original plot line that Liz was less than enthusiastic about, would I be happy to change them in order to get the job and write the script? And I was like, absolutely, yes, of course. Uh, you know, anything to make Liz Sladen happy as far as I'm concerned. The fourth story in the series is called Ghost Town. Slightly different to the rest of the stories in some ways, but I'll read a blurb. Sarah and Josh set off for a well-deserved break in a remote Romanian village hidden deep in the Carpathian Mountains. They're staying with Sarah's old friend, Yolanda Benstead, a retired journalist, an expat who lives in an eerie mansion with no one but her mysterious manservant for company. By chance, Sarah has arrived at an appropriate time. The village has become the setting for a top-secret international peace conference. Sarah is awoken in the night by a terrifying apparition. Is it a ghost or just a figment of her imagination? What is that unbearable noise? And will the others believe her story? But Miss Smith is not the only one who's had a fright. Conference delegates are being terrified too, literally scared to death. Is there something curious about the old house or something deadly about the whole village? It's down to Sarah and Josh to piece together the mystery that surrounds this ghost town. November the 22nd, 2001. The research experiments conclusive have managed to create the perfect pitch to induce complete sensory breakdown. I'd simply like to wish you a safe and happy stay in our humble village. 
And may the forces of oppression, hatred, and warmongering be forever banished. Faith in Project CIA faltering. I'm virtually a prisoner here. When I agreed to this, I never realized what it would be like. I haven't received any money, and I'm never allowed to leave the laboratory. Hello? Who is it? Oh. Did someone call? Cold. There was this terrible noise. What are you saying? I think I've just seen a ghost. Ghost Town, the facts and the trivia. Written by Rupert Light. Recorded 23rd of February 2002 at Moat Studios and released October 2002. Starring Elizabeth Sladen and Jeremy James. Uh, Sadie Miller isn't in this story because of the bust up and the, what happened in the previous episode. She has the episode off. Directed by Gary Russell, music and sound designed by David Dollington. This is the only big finished script written by Rupert Light, though he does act in one of the Excellus trilogy plays. He's the only writer on the audio series to go on to write for the television series. He wrote The Gift and The Lost in Time. And Elizabeth Sladen's real life husband, Brian Miller, is acting in this play. Well, as I said before, I think the, the five stories in this whole series are very different, and Ghost Town is probably the one that takes the biggest left turn out of out of the five of them. Uh, suddenly, we leave England behind, and we go into this you know, little you know, Romanian Romanian is it Romanian? Just someone new. Yes, you, yes, it Romanian. is it's Romanian. There you go. I've been to Romania. Um, so we enter this different world of ghosts and horror, and so it has a very different feel because it's more of a ghost story. And also, because a lot of the other stories have been Sarah Jane Smith becoming slightly more paranoid all the time, this one it is, it gives us a break from that because she's left England behind. It also, once again, gives Jeremy James and her a much better, better opportunity to work together, um, just because it's the two of them, um, without without the Sadie character there. But I, I just, for me, I just love it, having Brian Miller in the cast and the opportunity for both Elizabeth, Elizabeth Slade to work with her husband. Um, I guess it's a bit sad that Sadie Miller's not there, and it would have been the whole tree of the family. It's a bit yeah. disappointing for that reason. Yeah. What did you think about it? No, I thought Brian Miller did an excellent job, as he always does. In every Doctor Who he's appeared in, of any description, he's always been great. Where else um, did we see Brian in Doctor Who? Uh, we saw him in Deep Breath, and we saw him in Snake Dance. That's right. They're the two stories, and he did the voices in Resurrection and Revelation of the Daleks. Is he, is he Dalek voices in those two things? Yeah, he's in Revelation too, I'm sure. Okay, well, they, I had forgotten those ones, but I mean, he's, he's a, it's a great performance he gives uh, in Snake Dance, and also it's, it's, a, good, it's a good scene with Peter Capaldi as oh, well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. I think he's the supreme Dalek in Resurrection. I need to have another listen to that. Yeah, I think he is. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, this was, this was really different. This is... I really enjoyed this. This is my kind of story. Uh, very creepy. And it was. I thought it was resolved really well, although I did feel like it's a story that's been done before, but, you know, it doesn't matter. It was done well, so I still enjoyed it. Um, the other actor that struck me a little, that Robert Jezek plays, I th I'm sure he plays two characters in this. One character, he's playing a heavily accented character, and in the other... He's, he's playing some kind of American ambassador, which is obviously his normal voice, which kind of threw me because Robert Jezek has such a distinct voice. You could tell it was the same guy playing both parts. Normally, if you put on different accents, the actors can sort of disguise their voice, but his voice can't be disguised. Did you pick up on that? I, I think so. I mean, to me, it's always Frobisher. I think, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know we, we've never had enough Frobisher. Um, but yeah, well, it's still a good performance. I, uh, I guess I picked up on the, the fact it was the same voice, but it, it, I unless didn't it was it Mark Donovan, and I'm just well, as I say, it, it wasn't distracting. It was that, so I, I didn't, yeah, I didn't I, really I, notice. I, who. Could, I could be completely wrong. It could be um, Mark Donovan playing the other character, but the voices sounded they both sounded like Robert Jezik, but it, to me, so I could be wrong. I have to go back and listen to it again, as should everybody. Yes, it's an excellent story. The, the scenes where Sarah Jane is being frightened by 
the the ghostly uh, appearances is uh, really really sensationally done. Uh, really good for audio. Yeah, and just so well acted. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. As was mentioned earlier, unfortunately, Sadie couldn't join us for this retrospective, but we did speak to Sadie briefly about her time on the Sarah Jane Smith series when we spoke to her a couple of years back. So we're going to show you some of that archive footage right now. How how did you come to be involved with Big Finish originally? Because your first productions were with Sarah Jane Smith. How did that all come about? Um. I think they obviously approached mum first and then she signed on for it. And then there was going to be this character, Natalie. Um, and my mum said, oh, well, you know, why don't, why don't we have, have Sadie try, try and do that? So um, I think it was mum really that signed me on for that, um, which was great, you know, to get to do something like that with her as well, you know, rather than just um, being on the sidelines, watching her do it, to actually get to work with her as well was really special. Um, but I think if mum hadn't have said that it was okay, I think they probably wouldn't have, a uh, big finish wouldn't have wanted me to do it. I think it was down to mum, really. Uh, how old were you then? Because you wouldn't have been too, you were fairly young still. Yeah, I can't remember, actually. I think I was maybe in my last year of high school, possibly, like 17, 18, possibly, I think. Um, I can't quite remember when it was. Was it 2002? 2002 and 2006. 2002 okay so 2002 about yeah about 17 and then 2006 I guess um a few years older than that so young youngish I guess yeah how do you think had you thought about going into acting at that stage was that what you were thinking about yeah so um I went to university after I finished high school and then I went to drama school afterwards and my mum died whilst I was at drama school um and I almost got expelled because I was she obviously was very unwell and she didn't want to tell anyone so I would leave to go and see her, you know, and I, I actually um, stepped out of one of our, the productions that we were doing of Comedy of Errors and said, you know, I've got a family emergency. I can't do this. And my principal at the time, um, who's actually Michael Craze's brother, so uh, Peter Craze, so Doctor Who connections all over the place throughout my throughout my life, um, you know, said to me, what, what you know, what's going on? Cause you're you're going to lose your place here. Um, and then obviously mum, mum died and everyone knew what was what was really happening. Um, and after that, I, I kind of stepped away from it. So um, being able to do this big finish now has been really nice for me as well to kind of get to go back into it because I um, I loved it, but I just felt I couldn't keep doing it after mum died. It was a very weird period and I didn't want to access that emotional part of me, really. I needed to close it off for self-preservation, so I just couldn't, couldn't keep going with it, really. So with the Sarah Jane Smith, so the Sarah Jane Smith audios, um, was it, is that what put, sort of pulled her back out of retirement, or had she, had she started doing some other acting work before then, or were people just keen to get her back? I think she was doing bits and bobs, but I don't think she'd maybe played Sarah Jane for a while before um, before they they came out again, um, and then <clears throat> it wasn't long after that, the two thousand and six ones, that she then got school reunion. So. It kind of all dovetailed nicely for her, I think. Um, now, Natalie Redfern, the character that you played, so she was in a wheelchair. I must admit, I didn't realise you were that young because she sounds old, um, you know, <laughs> qu- qu- quite mature. Um, how did you go mature about... Mature is the word, Philip. Mature is the word. Um, <laughs> how did you go about preparing for the role? I mean, did you and your... Did, you know, did, did the director help you much? Were you working with your mother? How, how, how did you prepare for all that? Um, I guess you just sort of approach it like you approach um, any role. So the director was Gary Russell, I think, and he's always been um, very supportive, very like Nick Briggs, really, that they let you have um, the moment to do your own thing, feel it out for yourself, and then they kind of guide you through it rather than impressing upon you how they want you to do it. Um, But I think it's like with any character, you find that connection where um, you and the character kind of cross over um, and find the part of you that lives in them so that you can tell their story um but i must admit i haven't listened to them for such a long time i I don't even know if i've ever listened to them i must i must um must do that really i've got a copy of them at my my dad's house i'll have to dig them out and have a listen well i've been listening the last couple of weeks and they really are top quality like a really great series 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, they, they're nothing. It's, it's interesting where they came from because you can see this. There's a touch of when, when your mother did it, there's a spin off, Cane Island Company, she did. So it's got, it's got a bit of a feel for that, but it's actually going much more into conspiracy theories and intrigue, which is a slightly different direction to where it would go later with the Sarah Jane Smith adventures. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're great stories and they're quite exciting. And it's, you know, her on the run and, you know, you're, you're the, aiding her and abetting her from the phones and things. So, yeah, worth listening to. <laughs> we listen to them. Um, once again, I mean, they were written by some pretty big Doctor Who names, like Terence Dix, Barry Letts were writing them. Did you have any idea about who the writers were at that stage or just you just got the scripts and did them? I, I mean, I, I definitely did know who they were and had the appreciation for the, the gravitas of... Um, of their of their background and I think that's only increased really um in understanding how much they changed the course of Doctor Who and um how important they were to the story as a whole of not just for Sarah but also for the Doctor that they were writing for at the time and editing for and um what a privilege really it's such a shame that all these people aren't here anymore you know it just um Oh, sad, really, isn't it? It just seems that there's this huge gulf now of just so many people connected to the program who have all passed away. So do you think the uh, audios that your mother did was part of the influence in terms of um, getting back onto the TV show? Do you think they played a role, or? <laughs> um, I, I personally wouldn't have thought so. I mean, I think that when Russell started writing his own Doctor Who, that he had a clear idea of where he wanted to go. Um, and we did a documentary recently for one of the DVD releases. I can't remember which which one it is. Um, and there's an interview on it with Phil Collinson, who said that he and Russell had only wanted Mum for the school reunion episode. It wasn't sort of approaching any of the other companions. So I guess they must have already wanted her and thought of her for that pre um, these big Finnish audios. But I guess um, anything that gets you back into that public consciousness um, can't can't help you know really um in kind of seeing and exploring where the character might go next well it's interesting when big finish wanted to do this spin-off companion series the first person they went to immediately was sarah jane smith and when the tv show wants to do you know wants to bring in the old companion the first one they go to is sarah jane smith um she the, the role the role really is the pinnacle companion and i think you know if anyone ever talks about you know what what does a doctor companion look like um it's always Sarah Jane's the first point of call. Mirror Signal Manoeuvre is the fifth story in the series and it is written by Peter Angelides. Here is the blurb. A bio-warfare scandal from the 1940s takes Sarah to a remote island in the Indian Ocean. She pursues the scoop with a fellow journalist from her former company, Planet 3. But why won't she contact her friends back in the UK? The more she investigates, the less Sarah recognises that she is the story. Josh and Natalie discover that Sarah has been searching for pursuers in the rearview mirror for so long that she hasn't noticed who's now in the driving seat. A long way from home and far from safe, will Sarah see the dangers in her present and the enemies from her past before it's too late? Goodbye, Miss Winters. This time, Sarah Jane Smith, you'll be finished for good. Sarah Jane Smith, mirror, signal, maneuver. Sarah, Josh, I've got the info you requested from the public records office. Interesting stuff. Uh, Not even a small tip either. My small tip is mirror, signal, manoeuvre as you drive away. Hi, it's Natalie. I really need to talk to you. There's stuff we should talk about and, and you holding out on me isn't going to help. Oh, oh yeah, there's um, there's someone from, from Planet 3 been looking for you. She's been asking after you since you went to Romania. You have uh, worked hard to locate me and uh, you have been lucky, Miss Smith, that's all. Sarah, you still haven't phoned. Well, you know that, so I suppose you must know how worried you're making me. <sighs> Sarah, where are you? Well, we do seem to have a lot in common, Wendy. So, what do you think of... Shh! Hmm? Not now. I've been spotted. What? Oh, look around the boat. Casually, as though you've dropped something. Now, see the man who's trying not to look at us. At the other end of the boat. Um, tall, well-dressed bloke. 
bit overdressed for this heat. Must be European. <laughs> He's been following me since Monday. Sarah, where are you? Get in touch. <sighs> Come with me to the car, Sarah, now, or I'll leave without you. We have to get off these islands. You're looking in your rearview mirror all the time for something that's not there. Mirror signal maneuver. <laughs> oh. oh, now that would be too much of a coincidence. And in our paranoid little world, we don't like coincidences, do we? Good evening, Miss Smith. A pleasure to meet you once again. Mirror Signal Maneuver, The Facts and the Trivia, written by Peter Angelides, recorded the 26th of February 2002 at the Moat Studios and released in November 2002. Starring Elizabeth Sladen, Jeremy James and Sadie Miller. Directed by Gary Russell, music and sound designer David Darlington. Patricia Maynard reprises her role as Hilda Winters, who first appeared in the 1974 story Robot. K9 is alluded to in the script for the first time as electronic equipment, and this had two covers designed for this release, one with Hilda on the front and one without, to keep the secret until it was revealed at the climax of Test of Nerve, so a trick that they still continue to do to this day. So we haven't yet spoken about the return of Hilda Winters and what a this this really excited me because it was it was bringing something different from the classic series something that something that we hadn't seen too often we'd seen the Daleks and Cybermen and all the the usuals but a, a villain that only appeared in one story in the classic series we hadn't seen that too much before from Big Finish so I thought that was really good and. She's got such a Patricia Maynard's got such a great voice for audio too, so it worked really, really well. Um, I like the international scale of this story uh, being being set in India. Um, some some really great voice acting there, which is uh, uh, Toby Longworth in particular does a does a really uh, has some good some good roles in in this one, and um, yeah, a really nice finale that wraps everything up nicely at the end yeah i fully agree it's, it's actually once again very action-packed so i must admit i, I enjoy the action um you're right I, i'm not sure that big finish has ever brought back a villain human up until this point i'm trying to think of any examples they've done anyway i mean they bring back the monsters they bring back magnus grill and all sorts of other evils well, like well, grill's human well, wow, but he, he, yeah, but he's mastered. He's from the future, though. A from contemporary human. Yeah, yeah, from, yeah. And, and, you know, he's scarred and he's, you know, he's still a bit of a crazy so and so, but he's probably the most human. But I yeah. can't think about any human character who, a baddie who they brought back, but I'm happy to be correct about that. I'll, I'll keep thinking about that now. I think Patricia Maynard really does do a, a lovely uh, turn as Hilda. I think there's also those, those links to Jericho from the robot as well. So it ends up being, the whole series ends up being uh, all these different ideas that have come back from Sarah Jane's earlier. That, that'd be Jellico, wouldn't it? It would be Jellico. What did I say at the time? Jer Jericho. Jericho. Jellico. Good stuff. <laughs> oh, it's been one of those nights tonight. <laughs> So yeah, I think one of those, it's just the, the action that comes through, the, all the links back to those stories with different characters. It's it's just so well acted. There's little giveaway twists all the way through, and there's been little payoffs all the way through the five stories, which all come to a head with this one story. So Gary Russell, a script editor, has planted different ideas into the different scripts, and then it finally comes to a climax here. There's one little you know, interesting bit of, bit of trivia I didn't talk about before, is that Gary Russell... Um, cut a scene from the previous story um, about how from ghost town about how Sarah could actually get guns in and out of airport security because of a special box she had, um, which suddenly appears with no explanation with this one, with Josh having it, which, you know, which, you know, you just accept the fact that Josh has somehow got through it all, but you know, it's interesting that that one scene, which was cut, ended up having, leaving a, a major plot hole in this one. But aside from that, it's a, it's a really great yarn, brilliantly acted again. And, your, it, it really leaves the whole series on a major cliffhanger in terms of wanting to know what happens next, which is going to be a number of years before we find out. Peter Angelides is the author of the fifth story and the, the final story in Sarah Jane Smith called Mirror, Signal, Maneuver. And 
Uh, we I have to apologise, first of all. We had some technical issues with the audio. It's not too bad, but uh, please be mindful that I do know it's there, and uh, I do apologise for it in advance. Uh, and we started off by uh, asking Peter how he came to hear that Elizabeth Sladen was returning to the role of Sarah Jane Smith. Well, I was at a convention in Newcastle, um, in the northeast of England, um, and uh, um, she was one of the guests. And somebody came and asked me in the green room, where I was talking to some other people, um, whether I'd go and have a chat with, with Elizabeth Sladen. And I thought, oh, that's, that's unusual, but I did, and I had a chat with her. And she asked me whether I would like to uh, write the bit of audios that, that uh, she was doing for Big Finish. Um, so that was the first time I'd heard about it at this convention. Oh, oh yes, fantastic. This sounds wonderful. Um, I was so uh, so overwhelmed and uh, and embarrassed by this. I said to some, something crass like, was I alphabetically first or something? Um, and she she politely ignored this faux pas and uh, continued to encourage me to write for it. So uh, so I did. I actually happened to be there as well, but she didn't ask me to write, believe it or not. I was like, actually oh, really? at, that, at this, I was, <laughs> I was at that same convention. That's you were alphabetically further down than, than I was. That's what it was. I know. must have been, and I wasn't a writer. How did she know about your writing? Oh, I suppose that um, she was. She'd been uh, told about it by by Gary or perhaps some of the others. I, I'd been on the list of people who Big Finish were thinking about inviting to write for stuff. In, uh, right from the beginning of, of Big Finish, doing their Doctor Who stuff, and I think that uh, I'd not been uh, able to go to one of their meetings, and so got crossed off the list. And then Gary had always had me in mind. Um, and so I imagine that she'd uh, she'd encourage him to she had him sorry he had encouraged her to uh, to think about me as a as a candidate. It's very flattering being asked by the lead lady herself, isn't it? Oh well, very much so. Yeah, I think that was probably what Big Finish thought. Get Liz <laughs> to us. And how can you possibly say no? How in, how indeed? <laughs> so was there some sort of script meeting with Gary? How did you find out about? Where, which story you'd be telling and where it'd be placed in the season. Gary had a, an overall view about what we were trying to achieve with, uh, with all of the scripts. And by that stage, um, the, either the first one or the first two had been written by Barry and by Terence. I can't remember what... St- anyway, they had an idea about this. They also had an idea that they wanted to have, spoiler alert, um, Hilda Winters as the villain, but they hadn't yet uh, confirmed that um, they had the, the actor available. So when it came to me writing my uh, my suggested outline, uh, we knew what we wanted to conclude. We didn't know whether she would be available for the final script. So I wrote one which didn't have her in it. And then when she became available, I wrote one that did have her in it. And also she was then fitted into some of the, the earlier episodes as well. What information were you given about the two companions? By the time I got around to writing mine, two things had happened. Uh, one was that they had an idea about who these characters were. So they were able to brief me on on who they were, including um, uh, some of the uh, things like uh, um, Nat being a, a wheelchair user, for example. It was that uh, I think David Bishop had written his script already. Um, so I I actually had a, a template on which to, to base it. And because this was the first script I'd written for Big Finish, that was also very helpful for some of the mundane but important things like how you, how they like the script to be laid out. The only thing we had, we had a few arguments, Liz and I. We certainly had a few arguments about various things. But once we got past those, we got into studio quite happily. So what were the kind of things that Liz was concerned about? There were just a couple of things that I'm trying, I can't tell you even whose script it was. She felt that I was sacrificing Sarah Jane's integrity for the script, that I was allowing the script to lead the character rather than the character to lead the script. And I was saying, that may be true, but at the same time, there has to be a bit of drama and conflict in this. And we had a few crosswords. Um, and, and <laughs> yeah, we did have a few crosswords. Uh, that was the year I didn't go to Gallifrey in Los Angeles, even though I'd even booked the, and paid for the plane at that point, uh, because she was like, nope, this has got to get sorted now. And I was like, well, I'm getting on a plane in about six hours time. No, you're not. I never went to Los Angeles because I had to stay and do script rewrites with Liz. But once we were in studio, it was fantastic. And she loved it. We recorded, I know we did, I think we did three and then we did two a bit later. 
And I think the bizarre thing is that I know the very last thing. No, mirror signal maneuver was the last one, but before that we did the first one. So we did the, we did the first one and the last one together um, because of uh, having Patricia, uh, which was something also I ran past Liz beforehand, and she was so excited to have the idea of working with Patricia Maynard again. And I thought that's good. So I was building all the way through these script, writing these scripts and putting the Miss Winters thing behind it all. Because um, that hadn't been in any of the writer's scripts at all, apart from Mirror Signal Maneuver, because Peter was the only person who knew what I was doing. Um, and then I rewrote, I rewrote a lot of Terence's. Um, whereas Barry knew or understood audio, Terence probably wasn't that as familiar with audio as I thought. Um, and he did have some very sort of florid moments and also some bits where you went, yeah, but the audience won't know what's going on. So I did a bit of tweaking on his one. And one of the things I ended up doing was I wrote... Nothing, it wasn't a rewrite of Terence at all. I wrote the opening scene of the whole series, which is the funeral of Lavinia. And that is 100% all me. And we recorded that separately. We, we did that. I, can't, I think that might almost be the very last thing we recorded of the whole show. And Liz loved it. And that really cemented and, or repaired any fractious relationship we'd had during the making of the show. Um, because she thought it was just the most beautiful speech she'd ever had to give, and she was really grateful. And the fact that I said this is going to be the opening of the whole series, and uh, she was she loved that. So yeah, we we had a lot of fun, um, but I didn't do the second series. John did that, and I think that was a lot to do with me going. I think I have done as much as I can with this. You know, I've told the stories I want to tell with Sarah Jane Smith. Um, and I think, you know, if we're going to do, I didn't think we should have done a second series, to be honest. Um, and I know Liz didn't want to do a second series at first, uh, but of course, John's got the gift of the gab as well. And he talked her into it quite nicely. Um, and it's a very good second series. It really is very different from, from my version, but it's a very, very good second series. And she had an absolute ball doing that as well. Um, and then by the time that was done, I, we were starting to, I was starting to move to Cardiff and she was doing school reunion. So that, that, that sort of killed off the thought of ever, ever doing a third series. So in terms of Terence and Barry, did they both agree because it was for Leeds? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And they took the big finish salary. Uh, but yeah, it was totally because it was Liz. Well, I'd like to think it was because it was me as well. Um, but no, it, it was, you know, the idea of writing for Liz appealed to both of them enormously. Uh, had Liz done much acting? I mean, the um, that, that scene you talk about that you wrote in Comeback, that opening scene she did, is played brilliantly. There's so much emotion in that. There's just... Pa- you know she's come back with force as an actress in that opening scene. Had she been doing much acting up until then? No. No, I think she'd just probably five years beforehand, maybe, four years before, and she'd done uh, downtime. Before that, I don't think she'd done very much. The, the, you know, this is this is the... The tragedy, really, that is is Liz's career, is that she was an absolutely fantastic actress. She's incapable of giving a bad performance. She is an actress who acts the whole time. If you look at all her Doctor Who's, you know, one of the things that there's a reason why she's a really popular companion and why kids adored her at the time, and it's because she acted so. If the Doctor's talking to Salomar, or the Doctor's talking to Lynx, or the Doctor's talking to uh, Harrison Chase, and Liz is in the scene and has no lines of dialogue, you're actually still watching Liz Sladen, because she's acting the whole time, and and it's nothing big and showy, and she's not drawing you. She's just behaving as somebody would in any given situation, which is what makes her such a good actress. And she's an instinctive actress, uh, which is why I think she's very possessive of Sarah Jane, is because that she, she had good instincts and she could, she could smell bullshit from a while off. So, you, you know, you, didn't, you never gave her any. And, and she could smell bad writing from a while off, so you never gave her any. And so she gave, uh, you know, I'd say she gave 100%. I'd say she gave 110% in every single performance she ever gave. It didn't matter if she didn't like the script, she didn't like a line of dialogue or whatever. Once you talked it through and said, well, that's how it's going to be, she still gave it that 110%. There's never a point where you can listen to anything or watch anything that she's ever in and go, yeah, you can tell Liz didn't like this because she's, she's switched off from it. That just never happened. She's always 
110% giving you everything she's got and everything she had was magnificent. She should have been a huge successful actress um, and she wasn't. And, and that was her choice. You know, she, she made the decision to, to not be a huge successful actress. And that was great for the rest of us because it meant we got, you know, things like Sarah Jane Audio and Sarah Jane on telly. But, you know, she could have been, she could have been in the Helen Mirren level of, of fame. Um, but she chose not to be. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's, I, I was never frightened. There was never a point when you're doing anything. And I know this is true when we were doing Sarah Jane Adventures on TV. Um, there was never a point where anyone would ever go, do we think Liz can do that? Because you knew she could. That you just would never. That would never be a question for anything you'd have in your mind. And certainly, when I was doing the audios, I never looked at anything and thought, "Ah, will Liz do that? Will she be able to? Will Will Sarah Jane? Will that work for Sarah Jane?" Because I knew that Liz would make it work because she was that brilliant. How, how do you make the choice in terms of where the stories would go for that first season? Because they're fairly ah, conspiracy driven. All over the place. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, that, that, as you said, this is undercurrent of. of Sarah knows she's under attack, but she doesn't know from where. And then the the big conclusion, of course, is Hilda in the final story that we've seen in the movie. So was that your okay. said, Peter Jones, was that your choice? How, how do you decide this is where we're going with a story This like came that? out of the conversation in the coffee shop at Bond Street. Um, I kept using the phrase X-Files to her, which uh, wasn't always what she wanted, but she could see once I explained what I meant. So I wanted... I wanted one story that felt very traditional Doctor Who, which ended up being Terence's. I wanted one that was kind of quite hard sci-fi, which ended up being David Bishop's. I wanted one that was a, a spy genre, which ended up being Peter Angelides. I wanted one that was a ghost story. That was Rupert's. And Barry's was the sort of the loose one in the middle that would link everything together and we'd see what Barry came up with. Um, so I said, you know, I, I want... Each of these is a, it's not pastiche, it's not the right word, but it's, it's a nod in the direction of the various kinds of Doctor Who stories you could have. And I said, so I wanted one each for this first series of Sarah Jane. Originally, there was never any intention whatsoever that there would be a running thread through it. I'm not somebody who, who particularly loves broad arcs. Um, and the whole thing about Hilda coming in, she was originally only ever going to be in the last story. And it was only once I had talked to Patricia Maynard and she'd said yes. And I said to Liz, Pat has said yes, that I thought, I'm, I'm wasting this, aren't I? I'm wasting this brilliant actress and this brilliant character by only pulling her in at the very end and going, ha ha, I'm actually the person who's behind all the misfortunes you've gone through. So suddenly I wanted to put her into two other stories. So I put her in the very first story and I put her in one of the other stories just to have one or two lines. And then... Yeah, this is the marketing manic side of me. I also realised I could have two covers that we could put out a cover. Yeah, you because know, Liz is the is the cover star of all of those four first four stories, and then the fifth one she shares it with Miss Winters. But it enables us to put a cover out that looked the same as the others without Miss Winters on, so that people would not know until the moment it turned up in the door on on their doorstep that there's Miss Winters on the front cover because she'd been revealed at the very end of, of the previous episode. And Liz bought into that completely, but it's because it was Patricia. I think if I'd said any other villain from Doctor Who, she'd have been a bit, oh, what's the point? As indeed would I, because I do think Miss Winters is the only one you could bring back. But because it was Patricia Maynard, she was just so excited to work. They hadn't seen each other since since Robot. And, and it was a lovely reunion the day that Pat came in and, and did all her stuff for the various stories. Um, it was really lovely to see them together. Gary talked about this series where he wanted to have a feel between the Avengers, Twin Peaks, and, and a bit of Doctor Who. Um, and so you, you're kind of the Mrs. Peel. So um, <laughs> how, do you, how, do you, how do you feel, feel you go in leathers and a uh, bit of kicking? Well, as, as previously discussed, you know, I, I spent time trying to be a rock star and I spent a lot of time in leather trousers. Um, Eventually they split because, um, you know, the ravages of age. <laughs> I bent over to pull my cowboy boots on during a during a filming for a rock video, and that that was the end of them. <laughs> so, so no, I feel perfectly comfortable in leather. It's just been a while. Um, I love the idea that I'm the Mrs. Peel. That is uh, that's just fantastic. I, I'm, I want a t-shirt with that on. 
Um, Liz was uh, was interviewed. There was a big finish um, extras um, DVD CD something um, back at, back in two thousand and two, I think. And it's an interview with Liz, and I'm in, and, and they interview Sadie, and they interview me. But I didn't know; none of us knew what the other ones had said. <clears throat> and when I got here and I, and I listened to it, eventually a few weeks later, I didn't realise that she'd said that I reminded her of a young John Pertwee. So, and she says, "I don't know how he's going to feel about that, but that's that's there it is." <laughs> and I was listening to it laughing. I thought, "Well, that's a wonderful tribute." Um, so, John Pertwee and Mrs. Peel. I mean, this is I'm coming out of this really well, to be fair. But yeah, I mean, I think I, I think there was um, those elements. I like the idea that, that Twin Peaks is thrown in. Um, it's certainly quite Doctor Who-y, but it, um, what was the other one? The Avengers. Yeah, because there's that, there's the dynamism, there's the getting into scrapes, um, and there's the kind of, and there's, as you say, it's the inverse relationship between Steed and Peel and, you know, Liz and Jez, Sarah and Josh, and there's 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 definitely element elements of that. I think that's quite nice. Nice. And, uh, and, I think nice. It's, and push, pushing realism just a bit beyond what's realistic. Yeah. So you know, the, the, you had you had to yeah, you know, Sarah, you know, in the banks and other things, which is it was just a bit heightened. What was your impression of of Sadie? Because she was she was uh, brought in. She got a larger role than. Um, was stipulated by Liz because I think she wanted Sadie to have a bit of a role, but she was new to acting too. So what was your, what were your impressions of her? How'd you get on? Yeah, actually, we we both sort of bonded over the fact that <clears throat> neither of us were professional actors, really. Um, and, then, and people heard us talk like this, and they were saying, "Oh, don't be ridiculous! You're very good," and all this sort of stuff. And it was like, "Well, that's that's not that's not what we mean. Um, we just mean that we don't have, you know, we um, Sadie and I would sit in the green room um, and we'd listen to all the." guest cast you know the, the, some of these episodes had casts of like 10 or 12 they'd o- often be littered with oh well of course then i did oh and then i'm waiting for him to call me of course and then i'm looking at what they were doing up there in in um uh, this theater and then doing some rep up in scotland and then we'd be like do you want a twix so, yeah yeah cheers you know and it was so we kind of we were we were kind of the re- we were the real people um and i liked i liked sadie i mean it was got I felt like a bit like a a bit like a big brother, um, and that was the fa- it was sort of like a family dynamic going on. But she was just really natural, and she was really really good. I and I respected her because I knew that she was coming into it new, and I knew that people were you know that nobody was saying it, but and you know the worry in her mind was that people are saying, "Oh, I'm only in this because my mum," and that can that that can have an effect. And so, like the more kind of homely and kind of cozy it became, the the more that Sadie was able to relax, and she was. I think she was deeply professional about it, actually. And she was also, she didn't get, she wasn't affected by this idea of she had to act it. She didn't, she didn't, she didn't embellish stuff, right? She just, she just got on with it and she played, she played it fairly, fairly, fairly straight. And, and she, she behaved with the script and, and actually that comes through in the performance and she's just totally solid. Um, So, you know, great. Great credit to her for that because I suppose that probably wasn't necessarily the easiest the easiest gig to do. Just walk in and everyone go, "Oh, you're your Sarah's daughter, um, Sarah's daughter." This <laughs> reality hinge swings wide. No, um, so I think yeah, being Liz's daughter is um, is something that could have could have been a could have been an element for her, but I don't think it was at all. So she was she was really good fun. She was just super nice and super easy to get on with. There wasn't anything spiky about her at all. Her mum was a bit like that too. So. As well as Liz's daughter, you also work with Liz's husband in the fourth series, fourth episode with Brian Miller. Brian, Brian Miller, yeah, yeah. So, what, what was family it like? room? Yeah, how, how I mean, Sadie wasn't in that episode typically. Um, that's, that's the yeah. So, what, what was the what, what was the dimensions between with Liz and Brian acting together? Was it obviously their husband and wife, or just another day with actors? No, no, not at all. It wasn't like um, oh, I don't know. There are kind of husband and wife. Um, teams, lovies that are always working together, aren't they? I mean, I'm not going to say anything in case in case it comes across wrong, but you you didn't get the feeling that there was they were just totally professional. Brian just came in and did his thing, and like like a, like an, like another guest actor. I mean, obviously he's hugely experienced and um, and uh, very very good, and very strong. Um, but there was no, yeah, it was like super professional, and I was surprised. I thought there'd be a bit more, you know, banter and mucking about but no it was it was straight down the line i mean you know the, the, 
proper proper actors doing proper things. I was I was quite impressed. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be at all. Uh, it, but he was really he was lovely. He was and he was um, very modest. Like he was quite quiet. Um, and I think that's just it. that's just maybe that's who, who he is as a person. Um, but in terms of is there always oh, there quite clearly a kind of um, marriage dynamic going on? You'd never have known. Have you ever had to have a script checked by the lead actors before or, or since? It's a common thing. Not generally, no, no. I don't. I don't think I haven't encountered that. No. I mean, obviously, I mean. So I've written for the main Doctor Who range for Big Finish, and I did a an Unbound Phil Fos and Five we talked about previously, and those have to get signed off by the BBC Doctor Who office, whatever it is, at any given moment. And I've written for for TV shows for the BBC, but most of them don't have actor approval. They're not actor contingent. I mean, that's when you get sort of either superstar names or people that they have a particular. Uh, affinity to the character. If you're going to have Liz Slade and if you're going to have Sarah Jane and, and Liz Slade when she was still with us, then you have Liz Slade and play the part. You don't you don't recast while the actor's still available to play. Um, sadly, not the case now. But at the time, you know, Liz wanted to do it, and the success of the series rarely was contingent upon having Liz signed up, enthusiastic and and you know fully behind it. So so that was unusual. I hadn't had that situation before, and the element which Liz was uncertain about was my original plot line. I've read it this morning and it was, went quite hardcore on the politics of things, actually, because it was basically Carver, the character in the story, James Carver, believes he's dying of Gulf War syndrome because he fought in the Gulf War and now him and a lot of his fellow soldiers have died or are suffering from the effects of what was called at the time Gulf War syndrome. So that was a big part of the story and he wanted that to be addressed uh, sorry, by the authorities and to speak out about Gulf War Syndrome and there to be an inquiry. And Liz was, I think, probably quite rightly said she didn't want it to be a hugely political story. So it was altered I'm from memory in the script to be more to do with experiments that were done on soldiers in a fairly slightly non-specific kind of way, which frankly ties into the, the history of what's happened in Britain over the years with places like Porton Down and Christmas Island, where they've done experiments and where British soldiers have been exposed to dangerous chemicals and suffered ill effects. Um, so that was the big change that Liz wanted, was to alter that, um, which I was very happy to make. So, yeah, so that was mid-January, and then it was time to start writing, write my first draft, and as fast as humanly possible. Uh, so I think I, had a, I, had, I gave myself a week to write my first draft, and it came in long... Um, and then I cut it down to a reasonable length. And then I sent that to Gary for his notes. And Gary said, came back to me and said, okay, plot's great, structure's great, characterization's good, dialogue, not so much. And some of this is very, what's called radio four drama. It's a lot of people standing around talking to themselves and musing aloud, which is not very big finish, I have to say. That's not the nature of the storytelling that you find in big finish audio dramas. They're a bit more active characters on the go properly motivated rather than just people staring out of windows having a soliloquy or a monologue just for the benefit of so gary was like said to me i will need to do a dialogue polish on this to punch this up and to make it work in a big finish style and i was very happy with that i said no please go ahead because he knew far more about audio drama than i did and i'm sure still does um but i was uh, pretty much a neophyte writer of audio drama when I wrote the first draft of Test of Nerve. So was there any sensitivity at all because 9-11 was so close to that particular time? Or was it just the fact that L London had always been the focus of terrorist acts and you just sort of dealt with it that way? Because th the, the whole world at the time was sort of on tenterhooks after that event. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things that they wanted to have for the Sarah Jane audio, certainly for the first series was the idea of the stories almost being torn from the headlines of the day. And, you know, uh, yeah, I guess, gosh, if it was November 2001, we're talking it's probably eight weeks after 9-11. So it's all very fresh in everybody's minds. So there was, I think that probably explains a little bit of, of Liz's slight trepidation about going too far down the path of what you're saying this is and being careful about drawing links between blowing London up and what's happening, what had happened in the Middle East in the past. So for obvious reasons, there were sensitivities. I mean, the reality, of course, is if you've 
if you've lived in in London or parts of the UK, and certainly if you lived in Northern Ireland before 1997, then terrorist bombings were just a fact of life. My partner used to get the train into Victoria Station uh, when they were going into co college at university. And there was an R IRA bomb was placed in a rubbish bin in Victoria Station directly outside platform number five, where they used to come in from their train to then go and get the tube to go to college. And it was only the fact that they were there and out, they went through the train station an hour early was the only reason why they didn't get blown up with that particular bomb, which makes it very, you know, really brings it home for you that this is the reality of the situation. So, yeah, it was a case of you had to be careful and you had to be sensitive to these sorts of things and realise that there are consequences to telling stories. The reality, of course, was the British government and, and services had had run experiments in 1963. They filled a light bulb up with uh, a, a non-toxic nerve agent. And at those days, you could open the window on the Northern Line on the Tube in London and you could drop things out uh, while the train was moving or while it was at the station. You just drop your rubbish out the window if you wanted in the good old days. Um, so in 1963, they dropped a light bulb full of this reactive agent out the window of a Tube station uh, in a tunnel to see how far it would spread. And it spread across the entirety of the Northern Line within an hour. It was, you know, X stations up and X stations down, and then it was spread through the rest of the network. And it demonstrated them very quickly. If you wanted to cause absolute carnage, you just drop a nerve agent inside a, a, an underground rail network and that's it. You can, you can kill tens of thousands of people incredibly quickly. And, of course, uh, it's what happened in in Tokyo, I think, in Japan in 1995. I think it was the cult, and they 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 did sarin gas or or ricin. I can't remember which one it was, but yes, yeah, with that particular cult leader, and he got all his followers, and you know they killed nearly a hundred people. I think it was terrible. So you have to be aware of what you're writing about and the sensitive sensitivities of it. Uh, but equally, yeah, it's sort of the the second half of the the 20th century that was at times just felt like life in London. So I do remember this coming out because it came out in September of 2002 and I, I mm. it was almost on the day of the, um, the anniversary and it really was mm. playing in everyone's mind. It was, you know, 12 months since the Twin Towers came down and, and things. So I think actually it made the story even more thrilling, if anything, and more realistic. And certainly this is a very gritty, honest take of what could happen. Um, I think I think one of your characters actually tells that story about the bacteria in the light bulb in in the story. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, blend, blending truth with fiction always makes fiction more powerful. And at the recording, I remember telling Liz that this bit in the in the script was at, was based on truth. It wasn't it wasn't something I made up. This was an actual, you know, documented fact. And she was like, shock, horror, kind of, you know, there because she thought I just made it all up. I was like, no, 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 this is all based, unfortunately, this is all based in truth. And that is an actual thing that occurred and tests were done. And then I remember, I think not long after Test of Nerve came out, uh, the, the, the intelligence services in the UK actually stopped the terrorist incident where they were planning to drop either sarin or ricin in the London underground. They managed to stop the plot effectively. Uh, and I just went, okay, that's a little bit too close to home now. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I wasn't living in London at the time, but nonetheless, you don't want to be the person who wrote the prophetic, who, didn't, who wrote the prophecy of some terrorist incident that then happens X weeks, months, years later. Um, like the uh, the pilot episode of the Lone Gunman TV show, the spin-off from X-Files, notoriously uh, predicts elements of 9-11. So. Yeah. Was it hard finding Sir Jane Smith's voice or because you loved her so much previously, it was hard to find her voice. Um, it wasn't. Um, having watched and rewatched so much, you know, Sarah Jane Smith on TV over the years, and also the the tape that that Liz sent via Gary with a recording of her talking about the character and how the character would be now. So that made it pretty easy. But you know, if you've watched enough Doctor Who as many times as I have, um, then it feels like. It's an old friend and you're just channeling an old friend and reaching back and how would they react and how would they speak? And, you know, and then uh, my memory is Liz would, you know, slightly tweak the dialogue as well. I mean, Gary did a, a significant rewrite to, to um, 
make it more propulsive and more uh, slightly more driving in terms of how the dialogue works and how characters talk to each other. And I'm sure Liz will have tweaked it as well herself. Um, her script arrived when she arrived with her script. There were an awful lot of notes written down the side of it, so she took it very seriously. As it happened, when I pitched my idea, as I think of it, I think that I was originally pitching for story three. And uh, was that David's? I th yes, it was. I think it might have been. Uh, uh, when, I, when I wrote it up, it, it, and I saw David's script come through as an example, I thought, this is doing the same thing that I've just pitched for. Um, so uh, I, I re revisited what, what my pitch was um, to do two things. One was to, uh, to make it more overtly the villain's motivations. And the second thing was, was, where, it was uh, where it was set, which was uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the Indian Ocean rather than uh, in the UK. I was, I was actually going to ask about that in terms of the, because um, I think it's Bengar is it the Bengaram Islands. Have I pronounced that? That's a good question. Whilst writing it was I didn't worry at all about the pronunciations, um, so uh, I just wrote it. I think there's a, a place called uh, I'm, I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong now. Coimbatore, anyway, wh wherever it was, um, and they're like shadowy islands and all that kind of stuff. So I just you know spotted things on a map and stuck them in the script and didn't worry about pronunciation. Um, as it happened, as I was travelling in um, to the recording of, of my episode, I got a I got a phone call from the studio. Uh, and I was on a bus or on a train or something like that. And they were asking me how, how to pronounce certain things. And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I, just, I just wrote it. And an early example of my uh, lack of experience or naivety about, um, about how scripts get put together is that nowadays when I'm script editing things, I ask the, uh, the writers to provide a pronunciation guide for some of the unusual names. And also if it's, uh, for example, a Blake Seven, so it's... Um, uh, a planet or a character that's appeared in the TV series before to make sure the pronunciation is provided that's consistent with what was on the telly. Anyway, so um, yeah, back to your question, which is, I don't know how to pronounce all these uh, all these names, I'm afraid, sorry. When I was in the studio, um, one, of, one of the only things I was able to mention of was um, uh, they referenced the, the chief executive officer of, of the company and the script says, you know, this is the CEO. And uh, the actor was was saying CEO because they just saw the letters CEO and pronounced it as they thought it was written. So this place in India, no, where you've actually been to, just somewhere you thought was exotic and sounded to work in this the idea of the overall story. I like the idea of getting out of the UK. I, I literally wanted to put some distance between Sarah and uh, and her support network, or independence from them as well. Uh, and see how she got on. And I'd been on honeymoon to the Seychelles years before, and I'd written a, I'd written a short story for Paul McGann to read on a, on a BBC audio called um, Earth and Beyond. And my story was called Me, and that was set on the Seychelles. And I thought, oh, that was quite interesting. Didn't really feel I'd explored it further. But let's look for other islands in the Indian Ocean where I, I might happen to set it, and also put it a little bit closer to... Uh, a larger landmass where other things could be going on. So that was the idea of the, uh, I think it's the Parambikala Alaya, which I thought was quite an interesting place to set things in India. Um, so that's how I came up with, with where it was set. You're always thinking about um, how you can be more extravagant on audio than you could possibly afford to do on the telly. And, right. you know, mm -hmm. you can you can just say you're in a particular place and then think about what would be an interesting soundscape yeah, I think I think the sound design, design did a really great job with making it sound like a tropical island and a you know, resort. It was, it, it was um, I think David Darlington, I think was the yes, Davy was the was the sound engineer. One of the things that the um, the the guidance from Big Finish at the time was uh, challenge our audio designers. They're really good. Um, you know, don't don't constrain yourself in what you want to do. So I wrote some bit of nonsense in the in the directions of one scene, um, saying something like. Uh, this is set on a beach, and in the distance you can hear the fitful cry of a fruit bat. Um, you know, just thinking, ha, ha, there's something for them to have. Um, to his credit, David Darlington found a, found a fruit bat and added that in, admirably, I thought. Was it crying fitfully? Uh, to, my, to, my, uh, to his credit, yes. Yes, it was, <laughs> it was very impressive. Oh, the other thing was that um, 
I was quite keen on thinking about what are the kinds of things you want to do uh, for connecting soon. And there's a, I'm trying to remember which David Lean film it's in, where uh, a scene cuts between a somebody throwing a piece of glass into a into a dish, and, and it immediately cuts to a train uh, with the, with the um, the boat. It's, it's a it's a lovely complement of the sound and the visuals. So I was thinking about you know what are the kind of audio options for for doing that, and uh, so I was thinking about things like having Sarah tapping away at a at a keyboard, for example, merging into a scene set on a train with the wheels going round. So with be inventive, challenge our audio designers. That was an interesting uh, cue or a clue for me to to think about what are the things I might choose to do rather than just concentrate on it being all dialogue. No, not only did you have uh, a character who Sarah Jane had met before um, in the story, but uh, also Peter Miles was uh, acting a part in your story too. So uh, were you pleased to hear his voice uh, uh, reading your words too? Uh, yes, it was great. I didn't know he was going to be in it until I turned up to the studio and, and saw him there. So that was, uh, that was a pleasant surprise as well. You, 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 you don't always know who you're here for. Uh, obviously, I knew I was writing for Elizabeth Slayton, but I didn't know who was playing Josh and who's playing. I don't think I, I don't think I knew at the time who was playing that. Um, and I, I didn't know uh, who, who the other actors were either. How would Liz and um, Sadie work together? Is it the first time they? I should. It's the first time they worked together as mother daughter. I think it was probably the first time they'd worked together. I don't know. I think it probably was. I know. I, I Liz was fine. I, Sadie was quite sort of a little bit daunted about seeing this other side of her mum <laughs> and being in, in, a, in, a, in a recording booth next to her mum and her mum would occasionally, you know, be quite waspish about one line of dialogue or maybe somebody's performance or something. And I think Sadie was like, bloody hell, you know, mum could be like that. And of course you had all three, you had the whole family on Ghost Town with Brian Miller too, didn't we you? We did, we did, because I got, well, that again, that was deliberate. I mean, I love Brian. I've known Brian as long as I've known Liz, which is, you know, more years than I care to remember. Um, so yes, I wanted Brian in there. That, again, that wasn't something that um, Liz had asked for at all. She said she, she never said, "Can you give Brian a part?" It's like she, we we used Brian on Sarah Jane Adventures. Liz didn't even know he'd been cast. Um, <laughs> it's like suddenly she gets the cast list for for one of Joe's episodes. It's got her husband in it, and she's like, "Hang on, what's my husband doing up coming up for doing an episode of Sarah Jane?" And it was a bit like that with this. I just said, "Oh, you know, I've got this nice part." I'm uh, thinking of asking Brian to do it. And she was like, oh, oh, well, I'm sure he'd say yes. Oh, that'd be good. And she said, oh, that'd be, yeah, we could, we could drive to work. We could drive to the studio together. Oh, that would be quite good. Um, but yeah, it didn't come from her at all. She, 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 she never, <laughs> never known how ever say, can you give Brian a part? Um, and they love working together. They, they've obviously, well, I know they worked because they, they met from working together. Um, but yeah, so she and Brian had worked together before, but I don't think she'd ever worked with, with Sadie before. Um, it was nice. It just made everything feel, without being iffy about it, it just made Liz relax uh, and it made it made everything feel quite family orientated. And they're saying she got on with Jez and Sadie got on with Jez. So the three of them became the three musketeers you know they they really did hang out together and and just occasionally make my life hell by me going can we go into the studio please and they'd be going no no sorry we're having a cigarette or we're having a cup of tea or we're having a talk you can you can wait another five minutes and i'd be sitting there going it's, it's excuse me but studio actors recording time no the three of them couldn't you know, it's like herding cats with the three of them sometimes um but it was enormous fun to do that show and, and I think, I don't think I realised how much fun it was until it was finished and there was a sense of, oh, it's over. And then I thought, God, we've actually made something really good here. Really, really good. I made some damn good actors come in and do guest parts. And, you know, I remember for the first one I, that we did, I got Roy Skelton to come in and, and, and play the villain. Um, and Liz loved that because she hadn't seen Roy for donkey's years. And, you know, it just felt felt right we were doing proper Doctor Who. We we couldn't do Pearl era or Tom Baker era at that point in Big Finish. But if I could have Liz and have people that she was familiar with, um 
it just felt like my year of Doctor Who again. So you weren't tempted to bring another season after this of Sarah? I I thought I, I was quite happy that I'd done what I wanted to do. That it turned out I'm not somebody who likes arcs, but having done it, I thought the Miss Winters thing worked. We'd left it on a slight cliffhanger if there was another series. I never pitched to Jason doing a second series at all. Um, I thought, and Liz never asked to do a second series of me, and there's quite a gap, I think. But I can't remember exactly. Uh, my years. series, we... How long? Four years. Two thousand. The oldest was 2002. The next one comes out 2006. Yeah, I was going to say, because we, we made it in 2001, because it was quite a long time between recording it and it actually getting turned into shiny discs. They must have recorded, John must have recorded his Sarah Jane before she went to Cardiff to do School Reunion, but only just. And I'm feeling it came out after School Reunion. I think the last one came out about three weeks before School right. Reunion. Was transmitted. Yes. But yes, I think it was made before she recorded School Reunion. Two new companions Sarah's going to gain. So um, Jeremy James and Sadie Miller um, playing Josh mm -hmm. Towns and Natalie Redfern. What were you told in terms of what they were like in terms of being able to write for them? I think there was a short, we got a short brief for each character. We knew that Nat was going to be in a wheelchair. Uh, that was stated up front. And there was a slight, my one worry about having having the character sat in the wheelchair who stays back at base and just does all the computer hacking. And there's an awful lot of that kind of character to be found. I mean, particularly in comics, uh, the Batgirl character, Barbara Gordon, becomes one she was left paralysed by the Joker in Batman continuity, then became Oracle, whose job it was to sit back at base with the computer and in the wheelchair and the, you know, on the headphones and the, and the mic telling people what to do and how to get around things. So when I was writing the character of Nat, I deliberately constructed my story to give whoever was going to play the character of Nat more to do, to give them a more dramatic story so their job wasn't just, you know, Basil exposition in a wheelchair, effectively stuck at base. Here's, here's some more info dumping of what you need to know now. Um, so I was very cognizant and, and conscious of wanting to give the character Nat a dramatic arc through the course of the story, which is why we end up with the sequence with her and Mr. Harris and the ticking bomb and all of that. Um, and then I think I had a short brief also for um, for the character that, that um, Jez plays. Um, and again, he was sort of not a crusty, but slightly sort of eco-minded, left-wing, a little bit of a conspiracy theorist. So he was sort of like, almost like a younger version of Sarah Jane, but without having travelled with the Doctor. So he was, you know, um, uh, an agitator of sorts, and he would be plugged into networks of people that would enable elements of storytelling potentially. Um so those were the two, I think I was given sort of thumbnail sketches for both characters and it was a case of what you could make out of those and how you could build on those. And I think from memory, I, my script was actually the first one that got submitted for the series. Um, so I think I ended up slightly uh, defining those characters for other people to, to use as an example, obviously with, with Gary's uh, tweaks and rewrites as required. Marta says to me, you created Mr. Harris and then he was then put back into subsequent scripts, other scripts, even though he was originally your creation. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds right, because I think he got sort of retrofitted into into Terence's script for Comeback. Uh, he appears in that. And then obviously he's a, he's a returns again in, in Peter's story, Mirror Signal Manoeuvre. So, yeah, so I created Harris because uh, I presume we can talk about who the big reveal is. At the end. Yes, I think that's fine. She's on the cover. 20 years has passed. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yes, yeah, so obviously the character of Miss Winters and the reveal that this is the, 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 the final boss battle, if you will. She was, I think she was going to have more of a role initially in, uh, in that first, in, in my first draft of Tested Nerve. And then it got sort of pulled back a little. So Harris became a more important character. So he was given even, even more to do to help to drive the story along, um, to hold back that revelation as long as possible. Um, so no, no, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed writing Harris as a character because he's just an utter rotter. He's just a, 
just he's his joy in what he's doing and his tormenting of Nat and all the other things, the terrible things he does through the course of the story, and his pleasure that he takes from it. I mean, it's it's virginal moustache twirling in its own way. But I mean, he does it so well. And and Robin Bauman, who who played the part, his voice was just like oozing menace. Uh, I just loved it. And when he was recording it, I went to the recording um, down in London and it was just wonderful just listening to him talking. And when he was saying the line, I just went, oh, see, this is, this is what it's like to write for actors who can then elevate your material and make it sound even better and make you look like a slightly reflected genius in comparison. So, yes, actors who make you look better are always a winner. And I believe that's Lisa Bauman's brother? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yes. So Bernice Summerfield's brother playing, playing the villain of the piece, yes. Yeah, he's got a great voice. Now, the other thing that I think would happen too was Ellie Martin, um, who's you know, Josh's ex-girlfriend trapped in a box. When you wrote the script, it wasn't Ellie Martin. No, no. Um, originally, it was a, a character was called Ruth, was the first incarnation of her. And I think she was, I think she was still, she was certainly Ruth in my original story, full length story pitch. I can't remember if that, that's the point at which Gary said, oh, we're going to use the character of Sam Jones, who had been the eighth Doctor's companion in the, the Eighth Doctor Adventures published by BBC Books, and they'd done some sort of deal whereby uh, the character of Sam Jones uh, was going to appear in the Sarah Jane Smith audios. And I'm not quite sure. So I think it got rewritten on that basis or written on that basis. And then something occurred, and then it ended up not being Sam Jones, and it became Ellie Martin instead, got substituted. So originally, in my original plotline, which is incredibly blood bloodthirsty. Honestly, it makes Eric Sayward look like a wilting flower by comparison. The character Rufus, she was in the original version of it, was in a box and she was going to be murdered in front of Josh on the tube platform uh, just to demonstrate how hardcore the whole thing really was. And then when it became Sam Jones from the, the Eighth Doctor Adventures, uh, either the BBC or Gary or whomever said, mm, we can't kill her. Um, could you try not to kill her quite so much? And then it became Ellie Martin instead. So Sam Jones got substituted off and Ellie James Jones was, uh, oh, sorry, Ellie Martin was then the companion, the character that that fill, fulfilled that role. Um, and she still got to live because that was how it was written at that point. And it was, uh, there was a lot of corpses lying around. It was getting a bit Hamlet by the end. So we decided one less corpse was, the story would not suffer from having one less corpse in it. Now, my understanding is it was actually recorded, though, as Sam Jones, and they had to go in again later and re-record certain lines to take it out. Is that right? That, that, yeah, that, that could well be the case. Yeah, I've, now I've got a feeling you're right. I think they ended up having, it was a late change. Later on, they had to do a, a tweak in that, in that. No, that rings a bell. I think that sounds right. 20 years ago. I'm a little rusty. Yes. One of the pivotal things that you do in terms of the characterization is you put a wedge between Nat and Sarah because Sarah has to make a choice between saving Natalie or saving London, and yeah. she chooses London over Natalie. Was that, yeah. once again, something that you wanted to do in terms of character arc or something that Gary requested? How did that, that whole decision come No, out? that's all me. That, 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 that's all me. Um, no, I love... You're just a mean so and Yeah. 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 Now I wanted to, I wanted to, in order to ramp up the tension, not just the race against time to stop the plot and the bomb and the da 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 da. I wanted to give Sarah this impossible choice. So there's that pivot moment where she can either, as you say, save Nat or try and save London, and with no guarantee that she's going to succeed in either endeavor. And she chooses London because oh, it's tens of thousands of people versus one life, and she makes the sort of you know. Well, without getting all Mr. Spock about it. Um, but nonetheless, she she has to make that choice. And I absolutely wanted to have that moment in the story because that leave Nat has to save herself. So that empowers Nat because the danger is it's very easy if you're not careful to turn characters who are disabled into damsels in distress without their own agency, without the ability to save themselves. And they shouldn't be written that way, is my personal opinion. So it was always the plan from start to finish over the development of test of nerve was that that uh, there would be that fork in the road, that absolute impossible choice for Sarah that she had to make. 
And then it was up to Nat to save herself after that. And that meant we could have, you know, tension escalating in two places and keep ramping it up and ramping it up. And then finally you have the explosion. We don't know if Nat survived. And then what happens with the guy with the with the nerve agent? So what's going to happen there? So, no, that was always the plan. Yeah. Okay, so what an amazing cast. You had Rose Skilton coming in to play James Carver. Um, yes. Yeah. Was just he was just a, what an amazing um, actor, I guess, playing a very strong and important role. Yeah, and he was brilliant at it. And I, re- I remember when I met him, and I went, "I don't know this person from Adam, but the voice seems really familiar." And then it was eventually I figured out it was he's. I can't remember was he Zippy or Bungle in Rainbow, um, Zippy. but uh, he's Zippy. Yeah, and, and and at some point he, I think he got goaded into doing the Zippy voice. Uh, which obviously didn't, you know, fit the story <laughs> with Telly. So that was just for the green room. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, and he was great. I mean, he was, you know, and I sort of, I don't know, I mean, having having been the voice of Zippy, I suspect he got a lot of work, as often happens with actors and writers, if you do one thing and it becomes well-known or, or it exceeds or it excels, then people will give you more of that kind of work. And I suspect he probably ended up with a lot more work not exactly zippy, but other things related to that. So I think the chance to do a you know a truly dramatic role, uh, he really grabbed hold of it with both hands and, and went for it. So no, he did a great job. Well, one of the main plot devices throughout the season is this conspiracy theory that Sarah believes, rightly so, um, that she's under attack and there's a view that she's just being paranoid. How much warning have you been given in terms of how you need to write that into this story? Because in the end, comes a major turning point at the end, towards the end of the story, um, where her paranoia is going to be turned and used against her. Uh, yeah, that was a, that was a thread we were trying to work through uh, in, in all of the different uh, stories. So, how do you make sure that it works? Is that, is that your job to do that, or is that more the script editor's job to make sure that that thread weaves through? The script editor gives you a gives you a clue and you, with the ideas about how you might illuminate or illustrate that in your story. And then in the background, you know, when all the scripts have come in, uh, the script editor can suggest changes or amendments or additions to uh, to help complement that. As I say, the first the first two scripts had definitely been written when I was getting mine done, and then by I was writing mine, uh, David had finished at least a, a good first draft of, of his, if not the whole thing. Now, excuse me about the ending, because the ending, you've got this very big climax, you've got, the car, you've got a car crash into water, you've got one of the characters, baddies, drowning, um, you've got another character threatening Sarah, who then Josh then shoots <laughs> in the head and does his first killing. And so you've got this big high point there here, and then it ends in terms of, because you don't actually know what's going to happen to um, the Miss Winters, and, that, and it's just oh, we've warned the police she's coming and they'll, they'll arrest her and put her to jail. And the ending just sort of really <laughs> wraps up really fast. I was sort of wondering, was there just a time limit in terms of how the ending happened? Or yeah, wh- wh- why was that conclusion done quite so abruptly? Do you remember why that happened? I think there's two things. One is you want to, what you want to leave it on to be quite action-packed uh, at the end of, uh, of the whole set rather than have it sort of into lots of other stuff. And the other thing is, as I recall, I wildly overwrote the first draft. And so I actually had some other stuff after that. And when I looked at it, I thought, actually, I don't need this. Um, it's it's just uh, like a sort of coda for, for what they do afterwards. And so wh- why don't we end it on the action and the resolution without any sort of post-action commentary on it? Uh, plus, you know, you want to leave things fairly open if you want to be able to bring back uh, Hilda Winters in a in another story it's kind of a cliffhanger without being a cliffhanger because it's open enough and you don't actually know what happened you just characters have suggested what is likely to happen but you don't know that's what's happened in terms of uh, the choice to make Natalie uh, put her in a wheelchair the first um, disabled Doctor Who companion what, how did that come about? I just decided uh, we, the, the, the disabled people needed representation um and it didn't, <laughs> it wasn't something that, you know, could slow down production. Um, it wasn't something that we had to do. I just made that very conscious decision that I wanted a disabled character in an audio drama. And, and I thought it was an interesting thing to make it a young person and use that at one point 
in the actual drama and use her her inability to really function without the chair uh, to give her a bit of grit so that she has to fight to survive with her mobility compromised. A bit of a um, window. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, but it's more to do with just, you know, one of my my biggest disappointments in myself, and I really am disappointed in myself at this, my whole eight years of Big Finish, is we didn't do enough uh, uh, colorblind casting is the wrong way to so because because we did do colorblind casting. I just don't think we cast enough um, people of color uh, across the board in Big Finish. There's there's literally you look at the photographs of of cast during my era on Doctor Who, and there are just simply too many white faces. And if I could go back in time and change anything about my time of that, I would be a little bit more pushing and a little bit more determined uh, to cast different actors and actresses. Um, so the, 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 the idea of, of putting her in the wheelchair was very much me kind of trying to redress an unbalance in audio drama. Originally you were going to have Sam Jones in uh, the series. What, how did that come about and, and why did you change it? Because you actually had to re-record some lines too, didn't you? Do you know, I'd forgotten that completely. She's in Test of Nerve, isn't she? I think that's the only one we did, we had Sam in. Was Sam replaced by Sadie's character? Or was she a separate character? No, she was Ellie, wasn't she? She was replaced by Ellie. That's right. Why did I do that? I think because I'd had this... Oh, God. I'd had a lot of abuse... Um, because Doctor Who fans, you know, we think Doctor Who fans on Twitter today can be abusive. Believe me, they were just as abusive 20 years ago at Big Finish. A lot of abuse that I hadn't put Sam Jones in any of the audios. And there was a reference to her in Minuet in Hell, which I then retconned to become Samson. A lot of which is to do with the fact that I just think Sam Jones is a terrible terrible character i think she is the single worst companion who's ever been created for additional media i think you know the books have given us some fantastic companions like fitz i think he was brilliant obviously benny um but sam just for me as a fan and as somebody who wrote a book with her in it i just thought she was dreadful uh, so there'd been this this kind of nagging online bullying. You've got to put Sam Jones in. So I think that's why I thought, we'll put Sam Jones into this. And now I'm telling you this, I can remember that came from Liz, who said, who knew who Sam Jones was, because somebody must have told her. And she said, no, hang on, this is my show. I don't want another companion put in here. And I thought, yes, thank God for that. Thank you, Liz, for saying that. Um, that gives me the opt out, and it was must have been during the recording of Test of Nerve that that happened, um, and so I had cast uh, is it Juliet? I think it was Juliet to play yeah, Sam. Yeah, Juliet Warner. She That's she right. actually recorded as Sam, and then uh, I Sam. believe you had to re-record some lines. So when we came to do something else, I went back and just re-recorded everybody who either said the word Sam to say Ellie. Uh, or we redid some lines and we cut some lines because I just thought, yeah, Liz is absolutely right. This is the Sarah Jane show. I don't think it's a good idea to have another companion, even one from the books, as a sort of semi-regular character in this. It just it just felt wrong. Um, and as I didn't like Sam in the first place, it was a very easy decision for me to go, yep, yeah, absolutely, Liz, whatever you want, let's get rid of this character. But it was her that brought up the idea of just having two former companions together like that might be overkill and i was like more than happy with that we had miss winters coming it would just made more sense then to get rid of sam and yeah we weren't that far down the road that it would have been difficult and i just went through everyone else's scripts and crossed out the word sam and wrote the word ellie we didn't have twitter in those days so where was that fan pressure coming from i was all on outpost gallifrey and uh, it was called outpost gallifrey and then what was it called outpost scaro something like that that was the main thing and there were you know i mean i <laughs> I used to keep it. I used to because 
I'm never somebody who, you know, I always had a lot of uh, bad reviews and abuse for my books. I used to have a website in the days when I had a website and all my books, all the, I would just say, here are the reviews of my books. And I always chose the negative bad ones because I just thought that was funny because I'm quite thick skinned when it comes to that. But there was a relentless campaign by a handful of people, including people who wrote the actual books as well, who really should have just shut up. Um, just, you know, big finish are evil because they won't include Sam Jones in something. Uh, nobody was running around saying put Chris Quedge and Ross Forrester in anything or anything like that. No, it was all about Sam Jones. And I just thought the character was just unutterably dull. No two writers consecutively ever wrote her the same. Um, and it wasn't anything to do with editorial at, at BBC Books, because I think they did their best. At one point, they took the character and they aged her by five years because they could see she wasn't working. Whatever you did, she just didn't have a hook that made people writing like writing for her. I don't think there's anyone actually who wrote the books who particularly will ever tell you, yay, Sam Jones was the... Whereas Fitz came along and everybody latched onto him and then there was uh, his compassion. I personally didn't like, but I could see why other people did. And there was a character, I think she called Angie. I thought Fitz was a superb bit of creation because somebody really sat down and it was probably Steve Cole and Justin and they sat down and they created a character and I don't think anyone ever sat down and created Sam Jones. I think Terence wrote a sort of one page of what Sam Jones was like, which was frankly just ace. And everybody towed the line with that. And then Steve made the decision at one point, I think probably with the help of, uh, it was probably Kate and John, to age Sam up by five years, which was a definite advantage. But, you know, you can't, you can't repair something that's that badly damaged in the first place. So it was easy to get rid of Sam and bring in Fitz and everyone else and so I was you know under all this moaning pressure from a handful of people online I thought right we'll put Sam Jones in here and then Liz went well that's two companions and Miss Winters and isn't that overloading and I was like good thank you yes and so she became Ellie. Joey Jane. So how, how... <laughs> Whichever name Jez wanted to use in any given moment. <laughs> how, well, because, how, you know, yeah how did he Jez get, how did he get his job? Uh, because I've worked with Jez loads of times. Sorry? I, mean, I love his voice. I mean, he's that, that very rich baritone. There you are. You answered your own question. How did Jez get the job? Because he's got the most fantastic... I think Jez, Jez at the age of about 21, sounded like a 60-year-old who'd been smoking for at least 45 years. Um, and that's a very interesting voice to have on audio. And so we'd used him in so many different things. And he was very good at doing lots of different voices. He's a very naturally gifted actor. Um, and I just thought, you know, I just wanted to give him a lead part for once. He was always coming in and doing. Sometimes he'd do a whole guest part for a story, but nine times out of ten, Nick and I tended to use Jez as our, look, we've got someone who's got four lines and a spit in a coffin needs to die horribly. And can you come in and do that? And Jez, in a studio environment, is one of those people that you always want to have in a studio. Jez is the sort of person you might phone up, and I never did it, but I could imagine myself phoning Jez up in the middle of it and going, Oh, God, this studio's got a really bad atmosphere today. Everyone's in a grumpy mood. What are you doing? Can you come down and join us for a cup of coffee or something? Because I would know that Jez would walk through the door and he would lift it and everyone's mood would lift because that's the kind of person Jez is. Um, and so I just wanted to give him a really good part and, and make him a lead for something. Have you ever noticed that on all the Sarah Jane covers, she has a brooch, a little aeroplane brooch, um, which is actually Liz's brooch and she was very insistent on wearing it and I think I think I don't it's years since I've seen it but I can't remember but I think she wears it in downtime as well um, and she said that's Sarah Jane's brooch and so she wanted to wear it on the photo calls that we did that little aeroplane is hers and she wanted it she said that's that's Sarah Jane's brooch um, and I think she wears it in downtime as well how was the studio under Liz Sladen then, with her in, in charge? Well, she, she wouldn't, she didn't behave like she was in charge. Because um, that's not really, she's not really like that. She, the thing was about, the thing about Liz is that she was so invested in this project. And she, what she really was. Um, she, like she'd, she'd, she'd have, she'd been through the script a million times. She'd, she'd gone through the characterization at a really forensic level. 
And you could tell because she think you could tell the way somebody thinks very deeply about it by the questions that they asked during during the production. Then, well, I was thinking about this actually, and I think maybe she would be more invested in thinking about that stream of, you know, there'd be questions back and forth with the writer, and and not, and I stress this, not in any way like um, a difficult person to work with at all. It was it was more that she was so. She paid so much attention to how Sarah Jane is written and how the the whole drama unfolds that she all of those questions were incredibly valid and, and often the writer would go, actually that's a really good point. Um, just give me a second, and then she'd, she'd actually tie things up that maybe were a little bit a little bit loose, and it was quite remarkable like the dedication to <clears throat> to the granular nature of how it had all been put together and and you know because she cared about how sarah jane was going to come across she really she really did in in this is not a this is not a jobbing actor uh you know doing stuff in a booth this is somebody who's like they want they care about my character it's it's the it's the thing that that i'm most known for I'm, this has to be right and she made sure it was right and and she and all of the time she managed to do that while being really a very good sport, uh, funny and self-effacing. And I was like, wow, she was she was all, all of those things. And so she didn't hold court because she didn't she didn't have to really. I mean, she she was she was Sarah Jane, she was leading it. You could tell uh, because she knew everything about it. Um, and so when you have that that level of investment and the authority on the particular niche project that this was, everything else kind of falls into place and you just have respect for her and it goes out and goes throughout the whole the whole green room. I mean, you know, she she'd probably see people like me and Toby Longworth mucking about and think and go, oh, bless them, and walk off and do something else. Because it's like, oh, let them, let you know, it wouldn't be a territorial thing. Oh, they're doing a lot of talking and that's sort of my production. I feel as though I should be representing a bit more. No, <clears throat> completely doesn't matter. She didn't care about any of that. What she cared about was that that her performance was good, that that the that the writing made sense, um, and that the ensemble came together to create something that was really really listenable. And I think I think it is. And I've listened to, I've listened to it quite a lot. I'm not so much in recent years, but I listened to it a lot when it first came out. And I I put it on my my iTunes, and sort of it would it would come in and out of my playlist, various scenes from the from the Sarah Jane Adventures. And I was like, it's 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 pretty good, and she's brilliant. She's brilliant in it, as I'm sure you'll agree. Yeah, definitely. There's there's a lot of scenes with um I mean Josh has a lot of to do in terms of the the rescue in terms of the bank at, at the beginning, um it plays pivotal roles in every story in terms of you know he's a companion who does a lot, sometimes a bit of a buffoon but not all I mean you know leaving the phone off as the standard things that happened in the first season with the character, um there was some reaction in terms of Josh killing someone in the final part of the f- first season, yeah um were you were, what did you think in terms of was there a place where to shoot someone in the head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought that was no. I look. I mean, you said it yourself. It's something a bit heightened. Um, and I think when you've got a when you've got a character like Josh, who is only ever one breath away from being a bit of a renegade, um, there isn't the self control. You know, you don't go to, you don't end up in a bore stall at the age of 17 if you've got self-control. Um, so I think that there's there's a sort of passionate um, freedom there um, and probably a moral freedom as well, <clears throat> where the moment will dictate uh, rather than the sort of um, a more lasting philosophy of how to, how to live and how to live with dignity. I think he's he's a hothead. And if and if you know he kills somebody because it needed to be done in the moment, you know it's that that's not very Doctor Who. That's that's much more, you know, it's probably much more Avengers. Avengers. Um, and and I think that that was an interesting choice for the writer to do. And I thought it was a, I thought it was bold, and I thought it was the right choice because it becomes serious. Then doesn't it? It suddenly. Uh, did you just kill? Did you just shoot someone in the head? Okay, Woo, we've just we've just gone somewhere else, and that's exciting. Um, but I, and I don't think it's out. I don't think it was out of character. I remember. Do, I remember doing. Now you mentioned it. I remember doing it. And I, and I was like, it was 
it was I didn't have to go anywhere else in my head for that it was it was Josh um <laughs> I, not it was me but I mean a lot of a lot of Josh is me um, but I mean obviously I, I don't I don't tell everyone about the fact that I've killed lots of people I just keep that to myself but in terms of I'm joking but in terms of Josh um yeah it didn't seem it didn't it was strong but it didn't seem odd we decided with the Sarah Jane character that she would see it as a mistake if every time, you know, she needed help or anything in her life, she would go running back to unit. I felt then she hadn't progressed. You can't go down the same line. I think she has a great affection for the brig, for everyone that she has, you know, been with as part of her life, but I really felt it needed a new slant. And what we also spoke about was that these larger-than-life characters, um, sometimes they're not on the side of the law. Sometimes you're quite attracted to people that you, you really know. Are quite. I wanted an element of danger. Now, it's not that he is... He's a good man, I think, Josh. But I do think that he walks on the edge, and I think that is quite... Um, I think she would lend herself to that. He brings with him contacts, and she's very reluctant to actually incorporate him at first. But it works. It works very well. So I guess that leaves us to say... Thank you so much to everyone who came back and had a chat with us. Jez Fielder, Gary Russell, Peter Angelides, and David Bishop. Thank you so much. It was great to be able to, to go through these stories once again, revisit them. And it, can you believe it's been 20 years, Philip? No, I mean, 20 years on and there's really hardly any dating at all. The, the, the only slight thing which is probably slightly dated now is just the use of mobile phones. But that being said, they were still... This is the, sort of the first big use of mobile phones between characters all the time, but it's become a bit more sophisticated today, our use of mobile phones. But nevertheless, it's, it's yeah, there's a, there's a scene where one of the characters leaves a mobile phone in her car in the glove box. Like, whoever leaves a mobile phone anymore, <laughs> anywhere, um, you know, they're attached to us all the time. So there's a couple of little things like that that happen. Because, but in, aside from that, it's still the perfect, perfect five stories, a brilliant, brilliant season. And having listened to them all again in the last couple of months, I adore them still. Excellent. Well, uh, we would just like to say, if you're listening to this uh, when the special's on, or even when it's not on, go and grab the Sarah Jane Smith collection from Big Finish, bigfinish.com, and just do a search for Sarah Jane Smith. You can buy them all as a single bundle, all nine stories in the two seasons of course we're only focusing on season one today you will not be disappointed there is not a clunker in here no five excellent stories five excellent writers and a brilliant start to a brilliant series excellent so that brings us to the end of our full episodes of the sirens of audio for uh, 2022 philip well where has this year gone don't ask me. I have no idea. But before you know it, we will be back with our look at the Big Finish releases for 2022 with our good friend Kenny. He's going to come back and join us. So uh, looking forward to getting you, getting back together with you in a few weeks, Philip. Yes, indeed. And we have a couple of amazing interviews already in the can to come back to some really big names, which I think people are going to enjoy when we release them next year. Oh, absolutely. I'm looking forward to sharing those too. The one person we haven't spoken at great length about is the musician and sound designer for Series 1, and that was David Darlington, who's still doing lots for Big Finish today. And he did a great job putting this special theme tune together for Sarah Jane Smith, uh, as well as all the sound design. It was really, really well done. So to see us out, Philip, I'm going to take us out with not our theme, but I'll take us out with the closing theme for Sarah Jane Smith, because I think it uh, still stands up today as one of the great themes from Big Finish. Great. All right, we'll catch you all next time. See ya. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 137, the Sarah Jane Smith Series 1 20th anniversary with our guests Gary Russell, Jez Fielder, David Bishop, Peter Angelides and Sadie Miller with your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. Our website is sirensofaudio.com. You can get in touch via sirensofaudio at gmail.com or contact us via any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time.